Chapter 13 of Old Time Makers of Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich. September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph. Chapter 13. Cusanus and the First Suggestion of Laboratory Methods in Medicine. As illustrating how, as we know more about the details of medical history, the beginnings of medical science and medical practice are pushed back farther and farther, a discussion in the Berliner Klinsche Woschenschrift a dozen years ago is of interest. Professor Ernest von Leyden, in sketching the history of the taking of the pulse as an important aid in diagnostics, said that John Floyer was usually referred to as the man who introduced the practice of determining the pulse rate by means of the watch. His work was done about the beginning of the 18th century. Professor von Leyden suggested, however, that William Harvey, the English physiologist, to whom is usually attributed the discovery of the circulation of the blood, had emphasized the value of the pulse in medical diagnosis, and also suggested the use of the watch in counting the pulse. Professor Carl Binns, of the University of Bonn, commenting on these remarks of Professor von Leyden, called attention to the fact that more than a century before the birth of either of these men, even the earlier, to whom the careful measurement of the pulse rate is thus attributed as a discovery, a distinguished German churchman, who died shortly after the middle of the 15th century, had suggested a method of accurate estimation of the pulse that deserves a place in medical history. This suggestion is so much in accord with modern demands for greater accuracy in diagnosis that it seems not inappropriate to talk of it as the first definite attempt at laboratory methods in the Department of Medicine. The maker of the suggestion, curiously enough, was not a practicing physician, but a mathematician and scholar, Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, who is known in history as Cusanus from the Latin name of the town Cus on the Moselle River, some twenty-five miles south of Treves, where he was born. His family name, Nicholas Krebs, has been entirely lost sight of in the name derived from his native town, which is the only reason why most of the world knows anything about that town. Cardinal Cusanus suggested that in various forms of disease and at various times of life, as in childhood, boyhood, manhood, and old age, the pulse was very different. It would be extremely valuable to have some method of accurately estimating, measuring, and recording these differences for medical purposes. At that time, watches had not yet been invented, and it would have been very difficult to have estimated the time by the clocks, for almost the only clocks in existence were those in the towers of the cathedrals and of the public buildings. The first watches... Nuremberg eggs, as they were called, were not made by Peter Henlon until well on into the next century. The only method of measuring time with any accuracy in private houses was the clepsydra, or water clock, which measured the time intervals by the flow of a definite amount of water. Cardinal Cusanus suggested then that the water clock should be employed for estimating the pulse frequency. His idea was that the amount of water which flowed while a hundred beats of the pulse were counted should be weighed, and this weight compared with that of the average weight of water which flowed while a hundred beats of the normal pulse of a number of individuals of the same age and constitution were being counted. This was a very single and very ingenious suggestion. We have no means of knowing now whether it was adopted to any extent or not. It may seem rather surprising that a cardinal should have been the one to make such a suggestion. Cusanus, however, 
was very much interested in mathematics and in the natural sciences, and we have many wonderful suggestions from his pen. He was the first, for instance, to suggest, more than a century before Copernicus, that the earth was not the center of the universe, and that it would not be absolutely at rest, or, as he said, devoid of all motion. His words are, quote, Terra igniter, quo centrum esse nequit, motu omni carere non potest, end quote. He described very clearly how the earth moved round its own axis, and then he added, what cannot fail to be a surprising declaration for those in the modern times who think such an idea of much later origin, that he considered that the earth itself cannot be fixed, but moves as do the other stars in the heavens. The expression is so astonishing at that time in the world's history that it seems worth the while to give it in its original form, so that it may be seen clearly that it is not any subsequent far-fetched interpretation of his opinion, but the actual words themselves that convey his idea. He said, Considerave quad terra ista non potest esse fixa, sed movitur et alive stelle. End quote. How clearly Cusanus anticipated another phase of our modern views may be judged from what he has to say in De Docta Ignorantia with regard to the constitution of the sun. It is all the more surprising that he should by some form of intuition reach such a conclusion, for the ordinary sources of information with regard to the sun would not suggest such an expression except to a genius, whose intuition outran by far the knowledge of his time. The cardinal said, quote, To a spectator on the surface of the sun, the splendor which appears to us would be invisible, since it contains, as it were, an earth for its central mass, with a circumferential envelope of light and heat, and between the two an atmosphere of water and clouds and of ambient air. End quote. After reading that bit of precious astronomical science announced nearly five centuries ago, it is easy to understand how Copernicus could have anticipated other phases of our knowledge as he did in his declarations, that the figure of the earth is not a sphere, but is somewhat irregular, and that the orbit of the earth is not circular. Cusanus was an extremely practical man, and was constantly looking for and devising methods of applying practical principles of science to ordinary life. As we shall see in discussing his suggestion for the estimation of the pulse rate later on, he made many other similar suggestions for diagnostic purposes in medicine, and set forth other applications of mathematics and mechanics to his generation. Many of Cusanus' books have curiously modern names. He wrote, for instance, a series of mathematical treatises in Latin, of course, on geometric transmutations, on arithmetical complements, on mathematical complements, on mathematical perfection, and on the correction of the calendar. In his time, the calendar was in error by more than nine days, and Cusanus was one of those who aroused sufficient interest in the subject, so that in the next century, the correction was actually made by the great Jesuit mathematician, Father Clavius. Perhaps the work of Cusanus that is best known is that On Learned Ignorance, De Docta Ignorantia, in which the Cardinal points out how many things that educated people think they know are entirely wrong. It reminds one very much of Josh Billings' remark that it is not so much the ignorance of mankind that makes them ridiculous as the knowing so many things that ain't so. It is from this work that the astronomical quotations which we have made are taken. The book that is of special interest to physicians is his dialogue on static experiments, 
which he wrote in 1450, and which contains the following passages. Quote, Since the weight of the blood and the urine of a healthy and of a diseased man, of a young man and an old man, of a German and an African, is different for each individual, why would it not be a great benefit to the physician to have all of these various differences classified? For I think that a physician would make a truer judgment from the weight of the urine viewed in connection with its color than he could make from its color alone, which might be fallacious. So, also, weight must be used as a means of identifying the roots, the stems, the leaves, the fruits, the seeds, and the juice of plants if the various weights of all the plants were properly noted, together with their variety, according to locality. In this way, the physician would appreciate their nature better, by means of their weight, than if he judged them by their taste alone. He might know, then, from a comparison of the weights of the plants, and their various parts, when compared with the weight of the blood and the urine, how to make an application and a dosage of drugs from the concordances and differences of the medicaments, and even might be able to make an excellent prognosis in the same way. Thus, from static experiments, he would approach by a more precise knowledge to every kind of information. Do you not think, if you would permit the water from the narrow opening of a clepsydra, or water clock, to flow into a basin for as long as was necessary to count the pulse a hundred times in a healthy young man, and then to do the same thing for an ailing young man, that there would be a noticeable difference between the weights of the water that would flow during the period? From the weight of the water, therefore, one would arrive at a better knowledge of the differences in the pulse of the young and the old, the healthy and the unhealthy, and so, also, as to information with regard to various diseases, since there would be one weight and, therefore, one pulse in one disease, and another weight and another pulse in another disease. In this way, a better judgment of the differences in the pulse could be obtained than from the touch of the vein, just as more can be known from the urine about its weight than from its color alone. Just in the same way would it not be possible to make a more accurate judgment with regard to the breathing if the inspirations and expirations were studied according to the weight of the water that passed during a certain interval? If while water was flowing from a clepsydra, one were to count a hundred expirations in a boy and then in an old man, of course, there would not be the same amount of water at the end of the enumeration. Then this same thing might be done for other ages and states of the body. As a consequence, when the physician once knew what the weight of water that represented the number of expirations of a healthy boy or youth, and then of an individual of the same age ill of some infirmity or other, there is no doubt that, by this observation, he will come to a knowledge of the health or illness and something about the case, and perhaps, also with more certainty, would be able to choose the remedy and the dose required. If he found in a healthy young man apparently the same weight as in an old and decrepit individual, he might readily be brought to the conclusion that the young man would surely die, and in this way, have some evidence for his prognosis in the case. Besides, if in fevers, in the same way, careful studies were made of the differences in the weight of water for pulse and respiration in the warm and the cold paroxysms, would it not be possible thus to know the disease better, and perhaps also get a more efficacious remedy? End quote. As will be seen from this passage, Cusanus had many more ideas than merely the accurate estimation of the pulse frequency when he suggested the use of the water clock. Evidently, the thought had come to him that the specific gravity of the substances 
that is, their weight in comparison to the weight of water, might be valuable information. Before his time, physicians had depended only on the color and the taste of the urine for diagnostic purposes. He proposed that they should weigh it, and even suggested that they should weigh, also, the blood, I suppose in case of venesection, for comparison's sake. He also thought that the comparative weight of various roots, stems, leaves, juices of plants, might give hints for the therapeutic uses of these substances. This is the sort of idea that we are apt to think of as typically modern. Specific gravities and atomic weights have been more than once supposed to represent laws in therapeutics, which so far, however, we have not succeeded in finding. But it is interesting to realize that it is nearly 500 years since the first thought in this line was clearly expressed by a distinguished thinker and scientific writer. There are many interesting expressions in Cusanus' writings which contradict most of the impressions commonly entertained with regard to the scholars of the Middle Ages. It is usually assumed that they did not think seriously, but speculatively, that they feared to think for themselves, neglected the study of nature around them, considered authority the important source of knowledge, and were as far as possible from the standpoint of modern scientific students and investigators. Here is a passage from Nicholas on knowing and thinking that might well have been written by a great intellectual man at any time in the world's history, and that could only emanate from a profound scholar at any time. Quote, to know and to think. To see the truth with the eye of the mind is always a joy. The older a man grows, the greater is the pleasure which it affords him, and the more he devotes himself to the search after truth, the stronger grows his desire of possessing it. As love is the life of the heart, so is the endeavor after knowledge and truth the life of the mind. In the midst of the movements of time, of the daily work of life, of its perplexities and contradictions, we should lift our gaze fearlessly to the clear vault of heaven and seek ever to obtain a firmer grasp of, and a keener insight into, the origin of all goodness and beauty, the capacities of our own hearts and minds, the intellectual fruits of mankind throughout the centuries, and the wondrous works of nature around us. At the same time remembering always that in humility alone lies true greatness, and that knowledge and wisdom are alone profitable in so far as our lives are governed by them. End quote. The career of Nicholas of Cusa is interesting because it sums up so many movements and, above all, educational currents in the 15th century. He was born in the first year of the century and lived to be 64. He was the son of a wine grower and attracted the attention of his teachers because of his intellectual qualities. In spite of comparatively straitened circumstances, then, he was afforded the best opportunities of the time for education. He went first to the school of the Brethren of the Common Life at Deventer, the intellectual cradle of so many of the scholars of this century, such men as Erasmus, Conrad Mutianus, Johann Sintheim, Hermann von den Busche, whom Strauss calls, quote, the missionary of human wisdom, end quote, and the teacher of most of these, Alexander Hygus, who has been termed the schoolmaster of Germany, with Nicholas of Cusa and Rudolf Agricola and others, who might readily be mentioned, are the fruits of the teaching of these schools of the Brethren of the Common Life, in one of which Thomas A. Kempis, the author of The Imitation of Christ, was, for seventy years out of his long life of ninety, a teacher. Cusanus succeeded so well at school that he was later sent to the University of Heidelberg and subsequently to Padua, where he took up the study of Roman law, receiving his doctorate at the age of twenty-three. 
This series of educational opportunities will be surprising only to those who do not know educational realities at the beginning of the 15th century. There has never been a time when a serious seeker after knowledge could find more inspiration. On his return to Germany, Father Krebs became a canon of the cathedral in Koblenz. This gave him a modest income and leisure for intellectual work which was eagerly employed. He was scarcely more than thirty when he was chosen as a delegate to the council at Basel. After this, he was made archdeacon of the cathedral of Leutic, and from this time his rise in ecclesiastical preferment was rapid. He had attracted so much attention at the Council of Basel that he was chosen as a legate of the Pope for the bringing about certain reforms in Germany. Subsequently, he was sent on ecclesiastical missions to the Netherlands and even to Constantinople. At the early age of forty, he was made a cardinal. After this, he was always considered as one of the most important consultors of the papacy in all matters relating to Germany. During the last twenty-five years of his life, in all the relations of the Holy See to Germany, appeal was constantly made to the wisdom, the experience, and the thoroughly conservative, yet foreseeing, judgment of this son of the people, whose education had lifted him up to be one of the leaders of men in Europe. It was during this time that he wrote most of his books on mathematics, which have earned for him a prominent place in Cantor's History of Mathematics, about a score of pages being devoted to his work. Much of his thinking was done while riding on horseback, or in the rude vehicles of the day, on the missions to which he was sent as papal legit. He is said to have worked out the formula for the cycloid curve while watching the path described by flies that had lighted on the wheels of his carriage and were carried forward and around by them. His scientific books, though they included such startling anticipations of Copernicus doctrines as we have already quoted, Copernicus did not publish the first sketch of his theory for more than a quarter of a century after Cusanus' death. Far from disturbing his ecclesiastical advancement or injuring his career as a churchman, seem actually to have been considered as additional reasons for considering him worthy of confidence in consultation. As the result of his careful studies of conditions in Germany, he realized very clearly how much of unfortunate influence the political status of the German people, with their many petty rulers and the hampering of development consequent upon the trivial rivalries, the constant bickerings, and the inordinate jealousies of these numerous princelings had upon his native country. Accordingly, towards the end of his life, he sketched what he thought would be the ideal political status for the German people. As in everything that he wrote, he went straight to the heart of the matter and, without mincing words, stated just exactly what he thought ought to be done. Considering that this scheme of Cusanus for the prosperity and right government of the German people was not accomplished more than four centuries after his death, it is interesting, indeed, to realize how this clergyman of the middle of the 15th century should have come to any such thought. Nothing, however, makes it clearer than this, that it is not time that fosters thinking, but that great men at any time come to great thoughts. Cusanus wrote, quote, The law and the kingdom should be placed under the protection of a single ruler or authority. The small separate governments of princes and counts consume a disproportionately large amount of revenue without furnishing any real security. For this reason, we must have a single government, and for its support, we must have a definite amount of the income from taxes and revenues yearly set aside by a representative parliament and before this parliament, Reichstag, 
must be given every year a definite account of the money that was spent during the preceding year. End quote. Cusanus life and work stand, then, as a type of the accomplishment, the opportunities, the power of thought, the practical scholarship, the mathematical accuracy, the fine scientific foresight of a scholar of the 15th century. For us, in medicine, it is interesting indeed to realize that it is from a man of this kind that a great new departure in medicine with regard to the employment of exact methods of diagnosis had its first suggestion in modern times. The origin of that suggestion is typical. It has practically always been true that it was not the man who had exhausted, or thought that he had done so, all previous medical knowledge, who made advances in medicine for us. It has nearly always been a young man early in his career, and at a time when, as yet, his mind was not overloaded with the medical theories of his own time. Cusanus was probably not more than thirty when he made the suggestion which represents the first practical hint for the use of laboratory methods in modern medicine. It came out of his thoughtful consideration of medical problems rather than from a store of garnered information as to what others thought. It is a lesson in the precious value of breadth of education and serious training of mind for real progress at all times. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marsitich, September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph. Chapter 14. Basil Valentine, Last of the Alchemists, First of the Chemists. Part 1 of 2. Fieri enim potest. Ut operator eret et via regia deflicat, sed ut eret natura quando recete tracatur fieri non potest. For it is quite possible that the physician should err and be turned aside from the straight, royal road, but that nature, when she is rightly treated, should err is quite impossible. This is one of the preliminary maxims of a treatise on medicine. Written by a physician born not later than the first half of the fifteenth century, and who may have lived even somewhat earlier. We are so prone to think of the men of that time as utterly dependent on authority, not daring to follow their own observation, suspecting nature, and almost sure to be convinced that only by going counter to her could success in the treatment of disease be obtained, that it is a surprise to most people. To find out how completely the attitude of mind, that is supposed to be so typically modern in this regard, was anticipated full four centuries ago. There are other expressions of this same great physician and medical writer, Basil Valentine, which serve to show how faithfully he strove with the lights, that he had to work out the treatment of patients, just as we do now, by trying to find out nature's way. So as to imitate her beneficent processes and purposes. It is quite clear that he is but one of many faithful, patient observers and experimenters, true scientists in the best sense of the word, who lived in all the centuries in the Middle Ages. Speculations and experiments with regard to the elixir of life, the philosopher's stone, and the transmutation of metals are presumed to have filled up all the serious interests of the alchemists. Supposed to be almost the only scientists of those days. As a matter of fact, however, men were making original observations of profound significance, and these were considered so valuable by their contemporaries that, though printing had not yet been invented, even the immense labor involved in the manifold copying of large folio volumes by the slow hand process. Did not suffice to deter them from multiplying the writings of these men so numerously 
that they were preserved in many copies for future generations, until the printing press came to perpetuate them. Of this there is abundant evidence in the preceding pages as regards medicine and, above all, surgery, while a summary of accomplishments of workers in other departments will be found in Appendix 2, Science at the Medieval Universities. At the beginning of the 20th century, with some of the supposed foundations of modern chemistry crumbling to pieces under the influence of the peculiarly active light thrown upon our 19th century chemical theories by the discovery of radium, and our observations on radioactive elements generally, there is a reawakening of interest in some of the old-time chemical observers, whose work used to be laughed at as so unscientific, or, at most, but a caricature of real science, and those whose theory of the transmutation of elements into one another was considered so absurd. It is interesting in the light of this to recall that the idea that the elementary substances were essentially distinct from each other, and that it would be impossible under any circumstances to convert one element into another, belongs entirely to the nineteenth century. Even so deeply scientific a mind as that of Newton, in the preceding century, could not bring itself to acknowledge the tradition, that came to be accepted subsequent to his time, of the absurdity of metallic transformation. On the contrary, he believed quite formally in transmutation as a basic chemical principle, and declared that it might be expected to occur at any time. He had seen specimens of gold ores in connection with metallic copper, and concluded that this was a manifestation of the natural transformation of one of these yellow metals into the other. With the discovery that radium transforms itself into helium, and that, indeed, all the so-called radioactives of the heavy metals are probably due to a natural transmutation process constantly at work, the ideas of the older chemists cease entirely to be a subject for amusement. The physical chemists of the present day are very ready to admit that the old teaching of the absolute independence of something over seventy elements is no longer tenable, except as a working hypothesis. The doctrine of matter and form, taught for so many centuries by the scholastic philosophers, which proclaimed that all matter is composed of two principles, an underlying material substratum, and a dynamic or informing principle, has now more acknowledged verisimilitude, or lies at least closer to the generally accepted ideas of the most progressive scientists than it has at any time for the last two or three centuries. Not only the great physicists, but also the great chemists, are speculating along lines that suggest the existence of but one form of matter, modified according to the energies that it possesses under a varying physical and chemical environment. This is, after all, only a restatement in modern times of the teaching of St. Thomas of Aquin in the 13th century. It is not surprising, then, that there should be a reawakening of interest in the lives of some of the men who, dominated by some of the earlier scholastic ideas, by the tradition of the possibility of finding the philosopher's stone, which would transmute the baser metals into the precious metals, devoted themselves with quite as much zeal as any modern chemist to the observation of chemical phenomena. One of the most interesting of these, indeed, he might well be said to be the greatest of the alchemists, is the man whose only name that we know is that which appears on a series of manuscripts written in the high German dialect at the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century. That name is Basil Valentine and the writer, according to the best historical traditions, was a Benedictine monk. The name Basil Valentine may only have been a pseudonym, for it has been impossible to trace it among the records of the monasteries of the time. That the writer was a monk, however, there seems to be no room for doubt, for his writings give abundant evidence of it, and, besides, in printed form they began to have their vogue at a time when there was little likelihood of their being attributed to a monastic source, 
unless an indubitable tradition connected them with some monastery. This Basil Valentine, to accept the only name we have, did so much for the science of the composition of substances that he eminently deserves the designation that has been given him of the last of the alchemists and the first of the chemists. There is practically a universal recognition of the fact now that he deserves also the title of the founder of pharmaceutical chemistry, not only because of the value of the observations contained in his writings, but also because of the fact that they proved so suggestive to certain scientific geniuses during the century succeeding Valentine's life, almost more than to have added to the precious heritage of knowledge for mankind it is a boon for a scientific observer to have awakened the spirit of observation in others and to be the founder of a new school of thought. This Basil Valentine undoubtedly did, and, in the Renaissance, the incentive from his writings for such men as Paracelsus is easy to appreciate. Besides, his work furnishes evidence that the investigating spirit was abroad just when it is usually supposed not to have been for the Thuringian monk surely did not do all his investigation alone, but must have owed, as well as given, many a suggestion to his contemporaries. Some ten years ago, when Sir Michael Foster, professor of physiology in the University of Cambridge, England, was invited to deliver the lame lectures at the Cooper Medical College in San Francisco, he took for his subject the history of physiology. In the course of his lecture on The Rise of Chemical Physiology, he began with the name of Basil Valentine, who first attracted men's attention to the many chemical substances around them that might be used in the treatment of disease, and said of him, quote, He was one of the alchemists, but in addition to his inquiries into the properties of metals and his search for the philosopher's stone, he busied himself with the nature of drugs, vegetable and mineral, and with their action as remedies for disease. He was no anatomist, no physiologist, but rather what nowadays we should call a pharmacologist. He did not care for the problem of the body. All he sought to understand was how the constituents of the soil and of plants might be treated so as to be available for healing the sick, and how they produced their effects. We apparently owe to him the introduction of many chemical substances, for instance of hydrochloric acid, which he prepared from the oil and vitriol of salt, and of many vegetable drugs. And he was apparently the author of certain conceptions which, as we shall see, played an important part in the development of chemistry and of physiology. To him, it seems, we owe the idea of the three elements, as they were and have been called, replacing the old idea of the ancients of the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. It must be remembered, however, that both in the ancient and the new idea, the word element was not intended to mean that which it means to us now, a fundamental unit of matter, but a general quality or property of matter. The three elements of Valentine were, one, sulfur, or that which is combustible, which is changed or destroyed, or which at all events disappears during burning or combustion. 2. Mercury, that which temporarily disappears during burning or combustion, which is dissociated in the burning from the body burnt, but which may be recovered, that is to say, that which is volatile. And 3. Salt, that which is fixed, the residue or ash which remains after burning. End quote. It is a little bit hard in our time for most people to understand just how such a development of thoroughly scientific chemical notions with investigations for their practical application should have come before the end of the Middle Ages. This difficulty of understanding, however, we are coming to realize in recent years is entirely due to our ignorance of the period. We have known little or nothing about the science of the Middle Ages because it was hidden away in rare old books, in rather difficult Latin, not easy to get at, and still less easy to understand always 
and we have been prone to conclude that, since we knew nothing about it, there must have been nothing. Just inasmuch as we have learned something definite about medieval scholars, our admiration has increased. Professor Clifford Albut, the Regius Professor of Medicine at the University of Cambridge, in his Harvellian oration, delivered before the Royal College of Physicians in 1900 on Science and Medieval Thought, London, 1901, declared that, quote, the schoolmen, in digging for treasure, cultivated the field of knowledge even for Galileo and Harvey, for Newton and Darwin, end quote. He might have added that they had laid foundations in all our modern sciences, in chemistry quite as well as in astronomy, physiology, and the medical sciences, in mathematics and botany. In chemistry, the advances made during the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries were, perhaps, even more noteworthy than those in any other department of science. Albertus Magnus, who taught at Paris, wrote no less than sixteen treatises on chemical subjects, and, notwithstanding the fact that he was a theologian as well as a scientist, and that his printed works fill some fifteen folio volumes, he somehow found the time to make many observations for himself, and perform numberless experiments in order to clear up doubts. The larger histories of chemistry accord him his proper place, and hail him as a great founder in chemistry, and a pioneer in original investigation. Even St. Thomas of Aquin, much as he was occupied with theology and philosophy, found some time to devote to chemical questions. After all, this is only what might have been expected for the favorite pupil of Albertus Magnus. Three treatises on chemical subjects from Aquinas' pen have been preserved for us, and it is to him that we are said to owe the use, in the Western world at least, of the word amalgam, which he first employed in describing various chemical methods of metallic combination with mercury that were discovered in the search for the genuine transmutation of metals. Albertus Magnus' other great scientific pupil, Roger Bacon, the English Franciscan friar, followed more closely in the scientific ways of his great master, devoting himself almost entirely to the physical sciences. Altogether, he wrote some eighteen treatises on chemical subjects. For a long time, it was considered that he was the inventor of gunpowder, though this is now known to have been introduced into Europe by the Arabs. Roger Bacon studied gunpowder and various other explosive combinations in considerable detail, and it is for this reason that he obtained the undeserved reputation of being an original discoverer in this line. How well he realized how much might be accomplished by means of the energy stored up in explosives can, perhaps, be best appreciated from the fact that he suggested that boats would go along the rivers and across seas without either sails or oars, and that carriages would go along the streets without horse or manpower. He considered that man would eventually invent a method of harnessing these explosive mixtures and of utilizing their energies for his purposes without danger. It is curiously interesting to find as we begin the twentieth century, and gasoline is so commonly used for the driving of automobiles and motor boats, and is being introduced even into heavier transportation as the most available source of energy for suburban traffic, at least, that this generation should only be fulfilling the idea of the old Franciscan friar of the thirteenth century, who prophesies that in explosives, there was the secret of eventually manageable energy for transportation purposes. Succeeding centuries were not as fruitful in great scientists as the 13th, and yet, in the second half of the 13th, there was a Pope, John 21, who had been a physician and professor of medicine before his election to the papacy, three of whose scientific treatises, one on the transmutation of metals, which he considers an impossibility, at least as far as the manufacture of gold and silver was concerned, a treatise on diseases of the eyes, 
to which good authorities have not hesitated to give lavish praise for its practical value, considering the conditions in which it was written, and, finally, his treatise on the preservation of the health, written when he was himself over eighty years of age, are all considered by good authorities as worthy of the best scientific spirit of the time. During the fourteenth century, Arnold of Villanova, the inventor of nitric acid, and the two Hollanduses kept up the tradition of original investigation in chemistry. Altogether, there are some dozen treatises from these three men on chemical subjects. The Hollanduses practically did their work in a spirit of thoroughly frank original investigation. They were more interested in minerals than in any other class of substances, but did not waste much time on the question of transmutation of metals. Professor Thompson, the professor of chemistry at Edinburgh, said in his History of Chemistry, many years ago, that the Hollanduses gave very clear descriptions of their processes of treating minerals in investigating their composition, and these serve to show that their knowledge was by no means entirely theoretical or acquired only from books. It is not surprising, then, to have a great investigating pharmacologist come along some time about the beginning of the 15th century when, according to the best authorities, Basil Valentine was born. From traditions he seems to have had a rather long life, and his years run nearly parallel with his century. His career is a typical example of the personally obscure and intellectually brilliant lives which the old monks lived. Probably in nothing have recent generations been more deceived in historical matters than in their estimation of the intellectual attainments and accomplishments of the old monks. The more that we know of them, not from second-hand authorities, but from their own books, and from what they accomplished in art and architecture, in agriculture, in science of all kinds, the more do we realize what busy men they were, and appreciate what genius they often brought to the solution of great problems. We have had much negative pseudo-information brought together with the definite purpose of discrediting monasticism, and now that positive information is gradually being accumulated, it is almost a shock to find out how different are the realities of the story of the intellectual life during the Middle Ages from what many writers had pictured them. To those who may be surprised that a man who did great things in medicine should have lived during the 15th century, it may be well to recall the names and a little of the accomplishment of the men of this period who were Basil Valentine's contemporaries, at least in the sense that some portion of their lives and influence was coeval with his. Before the end of this century, Columbus had discovered America, and by no happy accident, for many men of his generation did correspondingly great work. Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa had developed mathematics and applied mathematical ideas to the heavens, so that he could announce the conclusion that the earth was a star, like the other stars, and moved in the heavens as they do. Contemporary with Cusanus was Regio Montanus, who has been proclaimed the father of modern astronomy and a distinguished mathematician. Toscanelli, the Florentine astronomer, whose years run almost parallel with those of the 15th century, did find scholarly work which deeply influenced Columbus and the great navigators of the time. The universities in Italy were attracting students from all over Europe, and such men as Linacre and Dr. Caius went down there from England. Raphael was but a young man at the end of the century, and he had done some noteworthy painting before it closed. Leonardo da Vinci was born just about the middle of the century, and did some marvelous work before the end of that century. Michelangelo was only twenty-five at the close of the century, but he too did fine work, even at this early age. Among the other great Italian painters of this century are Fra Angelico, Perugino, Raphael's master, Pintruccio, Signorelli, the pupil of his uncle, Vasari, almost as distinguished, Botticelli, 
Titian, and very many others, who would have been famous leaders in art in any other but this supremely great period. End of Part 1 of 2「Chapter 14 of Old Time Makers of Medicine – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph. Chapter 14 – Part 2 of 2 it was not only in Italy, however, that there was a wonderful outburst of genius at this time, for Germany also saw the rise of a number of great men during this period. Jacob Wimpfling, the schoolmaster of Germany, as he has been called, whose educational work did much to determine the character of German education for two centuries, was born in 1450. Rudolf Agricola, who influenced the intellectual Europe of his time deeply, was born in 1443. Erasmus, one of the greatest of scholars, of teachers, and of controversialists, was born in 1467. Johann Reuchlin, the great linguist, who, next to Erasmus, is the most important character in the German Renaissance, was born in 1455. Then there was Sebastian Brandt, the author of The Ship of Fools, and Alexander Hegius, both of this same period. The most influential of them all, Thomas A. Kempis, who died in 1471, and whose little book, The Following of Christ, has influenced every generation deeply ever since, was probably a close contemporary of Basil Valentine. When one knows of what European and especially German scholars, were accomplishing at this time, no room is left for surprise that Basil Valentine should have lived and done work in medicine at this period that was to influence deeply the after-history of medicine. Most of what Basil Valentine did was accomplished in the first half of the 15th century, coming, as he did, before the invention of printing, when the spirit of tradition was more rife and dominating than it has been since. It is almost needless to say that there are many curious legends associated with his name. Two centuries before his time, Roger Bacon, doing his work in England, had succeeded in attracting so much attention even from the common people, because of his wonderful scientific discoveries, that his name became a byword, and many strange magical feats were attributed to him. Friar Bacon was the great wizard, even in the plays of the Elizabethan period. A number of the same sort of myths attached themselves to the Benedictine monk of the 15th century. He was proclaimed in popular story to have been a wonderful magician. Even his manuscript, it was said, had not been published directly, but had been hidden in a pillar in the church attached to his monastery, and had been discovered there after the splitting open of the pillar by a bolt of lightning from heaven. It is the extension of this tradition that has sometimes led to the assumption that Valentine lived in an earlier century, some even going so far as to say that he, too, like Roger Bacon, was the product of the 13th century. It seems reasonably possible, however, to separate the traditional from what is actual in his existence, and thus to obtain some idea at least of his work, if not of the details of his life. The internal evidence from his works enables the historian of science to place his writing within a half century of the discovery of America. One of the myths that have gathered around the name of Basil Valentine, because it has become a commonplace in philology, has probably made him more generally known than any of his actual discoveries. In one of the most popular of the old-fashioned textbooks of chemistry in use about half a century ago, in the chapter on antimony, there was a story that students, if I may judge from my own experience, never forgot. It was said that Basil Valentine, 
a monk of the Middle Ages, was a discoverer of this substance. After having experimented with it a number of ways, he threw some of it out of his laboratory one day, when the swine of the monastery, finding it, proceeded to gobble it up, together with some other refuse. Just when they were finishing it, the monk discovered what they were doing. He feared the worst from it, but took the occasion to observe the effect upon the swine very carefully. He found that, after a preliminary period of digestive disturbance, these swine developed an enormous appetite and became fatter than any of the others. This seemed a rather desirable result, and Basil Valentine, ever on the search for the practical, thought that he might use the remedy to good purpose on the members of the community. Some of the monks of the monastery were of rather frail health and delicate constitution, and most of them were rather thin, and he thought that the putting on of a little fat, provided it could be accomplished without infringement of the rule, might be a good thing for them. Accordingly, he administered, surreptitiously, some of the salts of antimony with which he was experimenting in the food served to these monks. The result, however, was not so favorable as in the case of the hogs. Indeed, according to one, though less authentic, version of the story, some of the poor monks, the unconscious subjects of the experiment, perished as the result of the ingestion of the antimonial compounds. According to the Benner version, they suffered only the usual unpleasant consequences of taking antimony, which are, however, quite enough for a fitting climax to the story. Basil Valentine called the new substance which he had discovered antimony, that is, opposed to monks. It might be good for hogs, but it was a form of monk's bane, as it were. Unfortunately for most of the good stories of history, modern criticism has nearly always failed to find any authentic basis for them, and they have had to go the way of the legends of Washington's hatchet and Tell's apple. We are sorry to say that that seems to be true also of this particular story. Antimony, the word, is probably derived from certain dialectic forms of the Greek word for the metal, and the name is no more derived from anti and monachus than it is from anti and monos, opposed to single existence. Another fictitious derivation that has been suggested, and one whose etymological value is supposed to consist in the fact that antimony is practically never found alone in nature. Notwithstanding the apparent cloud of unfounded traditions that are associated with his name, there can be no doubt at all of the fact that Valentinus, to give him the Latin name by which he is commonly designated in foreign literatures, was one of the great geniuses who, working in obscurity, make precious steps into the unknown that enable humanity after them to see things more clearly than ever before. There are definite historical grounds for placing Basil Valentine as the first of the series of careful observers who differentiated chemistry from the old alchemy and applied its precious treasures of information to the uses of medicine. It is said to have been because of the study of Basil Valentine's work that Paracelsus broke away from the Galenic traditions, so supreme in medicine up to his time, and began our modern pharmaceutics. Following Paracelsus came von Helmont, the father of modern medical chemistry, and these three did more than any others to enlarge the scope of medication and to make observation, rather than authority, the most important criterion of truth in medicine. Indeed, the work of this trio of men of the 15th and 16th centuries, the Renaissance in medicine as in art, dominated medical treatment, or at least the department of pharmaceutics, down almost to our own day, and their influence is still felt in drug giving. While we do not know the absolute data of either the birth or the death of Basil Valentine, and are not sure of the exact period even in which he lived and did his work, 
We are sure that a great original observer about the time of the invention of printing studied mercury and sulfur and various salts of the metals, and above all introduced antimony to the notice of the scientific world, and especially to the favor of practitioners of medicine. His book, The Triumphal Chariot of Antimony, is full of conclusions not quite justified by his premises nor by his observations. There is no doubt, however, that the observational method which he employed furnished an immense amount of knowledge and formed the basis of the method of investigation by which the chemical side of medicine was to develop during the next two or three centuries. Great harm was done by the abuse of antimony, but then great harm is done by the abuse of anything, no matter how good it may be. For a time it came to be the most important drug in medicine, and was only replaced by venesection. The fact of the matter is that doctors were looking for effects from their drugs, and antimony is, above all things, effective. Patients, too, wish to see the effect of the medicines they took. They do so even yet, and when antimony was administered, there was no doubt about its working. The most interesting of Basil Valentine's books, and the one which has had the most enduring influence, is undoubtedly the triumphal chariot of antimony. It has been translated, and has had a wide vogue in every language of modern Europe. Its recommendation of antimony had such an effect upon medical practice that it continued to be the most important drug in the pharmacopoeia down almost to the middle of the 19th century. If any proof were needed that Basil Valentine, or that the author of the books that go under the name, was a monk, it would be found in the introduction to this volume, which not only states that fact very clearly, but also in doing so makes use of language that shows the writer to have been deeply imbued with the old monastic spirit. I quote the first paragraph of this introduction because it emphasizes this. The quotation is taken from the English translation of the work as published in London in 1678. Curiously enough, seeing the obscurity surrounding Valentine himself, we do not know for sure who made the translation. The translator apologizes somewhat for the deeply religious spirit of the book, but considers that he was not justified in eliminating any of this. The paragraph is left in the quaint, old-fashioned form, so eminently suited to the thoughts of the old master, and the spelling and use of capitals is not changed. Quote, Basil Valentine, his triumphant chariot of antimony, since I, Basil Valentine, by religious vows, am bound to live according to the order of St. Benedict, and that requires another manner of spirit of holiness than the common state of mortals exercised in the profane business of this world, I thought it my duty before all things, in the beginning of this little book, to declare what is necessary to be known by the pious spagyrist, old-time name for medical chemist, inflamed with an ardent desire of this art, as what he ought to do, and whereunto to direct his striving, that he may lay such foundations of the whole matter as may be stable, lest his building, shaken with the winds, happen to fall, and the whole edifice be involved in shameful ruin, which otherwise being founded on more firm and solid principles, might have continued for a long series of time which admonition I judged was, and is always will be necessary part of my religious office, especially since we must all die, and no one of us which are now, whether high or low, shall long be seen among the number of men. For it concerns me to recommend these meditations of mortality to posterity, leaving them behind me, not only that honor may be given to the divine majesty, but also that men may obey him sincerely in all things. In this my meditation, I found that there were five principal heads, chiefly to be considered by the wise and prudent spectators of our wisdom and art, the first of which is invocation of God, 
the second, contemplation of nature, the third, true preparation, the fourth, the way of using, the fifth, utility and fruit. For he who regards not these shall never obtain place among true chemists or fill up the number of perfect spagyrists. Therefore, touching these five heads, we shall here following treat and so far declare them as that the general work may be brought to light and perfected by an intent and studious operator. End quote. This book, though the title might seem to indicate it, is not devoted entirely to the study of antimony, but contains many important additions to the chemistry of the time. For instance, Basil Valentine explains in this work how what he calls the spirit of salt might be obtained. He succeeded in manufacturing this material by treating common salt with oil of vitriol and heat. From the description of the uses to which he put the end product of his chemical manipulation, it is evident that under the name of spirit of salt, he is describing what we now know as hydrochloric acid. This is said to be the first definite mention of it in the history of science, and the method suggested for its preparation is not very difficult from that employed even at the present time. He also suggests in his volume how alcohol may be obtained in high strengths. He distilled a spirit obtained from wine over carbonate of potassium and thus succeeded in depriving it of a great proportion of its water. We have said that he was deeply interested in the philosopher's stone. Naturally, this turned his attention to the study of metals, and so it is not surprising to find that he succeeded in formulating a method by which metallic copper could be obtained. The material used for this purpose was copper pyrites, which was changed to an impure sulfate of copper by the action of oil of vitriol and moist air. The sulfate of copper occurred in solution, and the copper could be precipitated from it by plunging an iron bar into it. Basil Valentine recognized the presence of this peculiar yellow metal and studied some of its qualities. He does not seem to have been quite sure, however, whether the phenomenon that he witnessed was not really a transmutation, at least of some of the iron into copper, as a consequence of the other chemicals present. There are some observations on chemical physiology, and especially with regard to respiration, in the book on antimony, which show their author to have anticipated the true explanation of the theory of respiration. He states that animals breathe because air is needed to support their life, and that all the animals exhibit the phenomenon of respiration. He even insists that the fishes, though living in water, breathe air, and he adduces in support of this idea the fact that whenever a river is entirely frozen, the fishes die. The reason for this being, according to this old-time physiological chemist, not that the fishes are frozen to death, but that they are not able to obtain air in the ice as they did in the water, and consequently perish. There are many testimonials to the practical character of all his knowledge and his desire to apply it for the benefit of humanity. The old monk could not repress the expression of his impatience with physicians who gave to patients for, quote, diseases of which they knew little, remedies of which they knew less, end quote. For him, it was an unpardonable sin for a physician not to have faithfully studied the various mixtures that he prescribed for his patients, and not to know not only their appearance and taste and effect, but also the limits of their application. Considering that, at the present time, it is a frequent source of complaint that physicians often prescribe remedies with even those physical appearance they are not familiar, and whose composition is often quite unknown to them, this complaint of the old-time chemist alchemist will be all the more interesting for the modern physician, it is evident that when Basil Valentine allows his ire to get the better of him, it is because of his indignation over the quacks 
who were abusing medicine and patients in his time, as they have ever since. There is a curious bit of aspersion on mere book learning in the passage that has a distinctly modern ring, and one feels the truth of Russell Lowell's expression that to read a classic, no matter how antique, is like reading a commentary on the morning paper, so up-to-date does genius ever remain. Quote, and whensoever I shall have occasion to contend in the school with such a doctor who knows not himself how to prepare his own medicines, but commits that business to another, I am sure I shall obtain the palm from him. For indeed that good man knows not what medicines he prescribes to the sick, whether the color of them be white, black, gray, or blue, he cannot tell, nor doth this wretched man know whether the medicine he gives be dry or hot, cold or humid, but he only knows that he found it so written in his books, and then pretends to acknowledge, or, as it were, possession by prescription of a very long time, yet he desires to further information. Here again, let it be lawful to exclaim, Good God, to what a state is the matter brought! What goodness of mind is in these men? What care do they take of the sick? Woe, woe to them! In the day of judgment, they will find the fruit of their ignorance and rashness. Then they will see him who they pierced, when they had neglected their neighbor, sought after money and nothing else, whereas were they cordial in their profession, they would spend nights and days in labor, that they might become more learned in their art, whence more certain health would accrue to the sick with their estimation and greater glory to themselves. But since labor is tedious to them, they commit the matter to chance, and being secure of their honor, and content with their fame, they, like brawlers, defend themselves with a certain garrulity, without any respect had to confidence or truth. End quote. Perhaps one of the reasons why Valentine's book has been of such enduring interest is that it is written in an imminently human vein and out of a lively imagination. It is full of figures relating to many other things besides chemistry, which serve to show how deeply this investigating observer was attentive to all the problems of life around him. For instance, when he wants to describe the affinity that exists between many substances in chemistry, and which makes it possible for them not to be attracted to one another, he takes a figure from the attractions that he sees exist among men and women. It is curious to find affinities discussed in our modern sense so long ago. There are some paragraphs with regard to the influence of the passion of love, that one might think rather a quotation from an old-time sermon than from a great groundbreaking book in the science of chemistry. Quote, Love leaves nothing entire or sound in man. It impedes his sleep. He cannot rest either day or night. It takes off his appetite that he hath no disposition either to meat or drink by reason of the continual torments of his heart and mind. It deprives him of all providence, hence he neglects his affairs, vocation, and business. He minds neither study, labor, nor prayer, casts away all thoughts of anything but the body beloved. This is his study, this his most vain occupation. If to lovers the success be not answerable to their wish, or so soon and prosperously as they desire, how many melancholies henceforth arise, with griefs and sadness, with which they pine away and wax so lean as they have scarcely any flesh cleaving to the bones. Yea, at last they lose the life itself, as may be proved by many examples. For such men, which is a horrible thing to think of, sight and neglect all perils and detriments, both of the body and life, and of the soul and eternal salvation. End quote. It is evident that human nature is not different in our sophisticated twentieth century from that which this observant old monk saw around him in the fifteenth. He continues, quote, 
How many testimonies of this violence which is in love are daily found? For it not only inflames the younger sort, but it so far exaggerates some persons far gone in years, as though the burning heat thereof. They are almost mad. Natural diseases are for the most part governed by the complexion of man, and therefore invade some more fiercely, others more gently, but love, without distinction of poor or rich, young or old, seizeth all, and having seized, so blinds them, as forgetting all rules of reason, they neither see nor hear any snare. End quote. But then the old monk thinks that he has said enough about this rather foreign subject, and apologizes for his digression in another paragraph that should remove any lingering doubt there might be with regard to the geniuses of his monastic character. At the end of the passage, he makes the application in a very few words. The personal element in his confession is so naive and so simply straightforward that instead of seeming to be the result of conceit, which would surely have repelled the reader, it rather attracts and enhances his kindly feeling for its author. The paragraph would remind one, in certain ways, of that personal element that was to become more popular in literature after Montaigne in the next century made it rather the fashion. Quote, but of these enough, for it becomes not a religious man to insist too long upon these cogitations, or to give place to such a flame in his heart. Hitherto, while boasting I speak it, I have throughout the whole course of my life kept myself safe and free from it, and I pray and invoke God to vouchsafe me his grace that I may keep holy and inviolate the faith which I have sworn, and live contented with my spiritual spouse, the Holy Catholic Church. For no other reason have I alleged these than I might express the love with which all tinctures ought to be moved towards metals, if ever they be admitted by them into true friendship, and by love, which permeates the innermost parts, be converted into a better state. End quote. The application of the figure at the end of his long digression is characteristic of the period in which he wrote as also, to a considerable extent, of the German literary methods of the time. In this volume on the use of antimony, there are in most of the editions certain biographical notes, which have sometimes been accepted as authentic, but oftener rejected. According to these, Basil Valentine was born in Alsace, on the southern bank of the Rhine. As a consequence of this, there are several towns that have laid claim to being his birthplace. Monsieur Jean Renaud, the distinguished French philosophical writer of the first half of the 19th century, once said that Basil Valentine, like Ossian and Homer, had many towns claim him years after his death. He also suggested that, like those old poets, it was possible that the writings sometimes attributed to Basil Valentine were really the work not of one man, but of several individuals. There are, however, many objections to this theory, the most forcible of which is the internal evidence derived from the books themselves, showing similarities of style and method of treating subjects too great for us to admit non-identity in the writers. M. Reynaud lived at a time when it was all the fashion to suggest that old works that had come down to us, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, and even such national epics as the Cid and the Arthur Legends and the Nibelungenlied, were to be attributed to several writers than to one. We have passed that period of criticism, however, and have reverted to the idea of single authorship for these works, and the same conclusion has been generally come to with regard to the writings attributed to Basil Valentine. Other biographic details contained in The Triumphal Chariot of Antimony were undoubtedly more correct. According to them, Basil Valentine traveled in England and Holland on missions for his order, and 
and went through France and Spain on a pilgrimage to St. James of Compostela. Besides this work, there is a number of other books of Basil Valentine's, printed during the first half of the 16th century, that are well known, and copies of which may be found in most of the important libraries. The United States Surgeon General's Library at Washington contains not a few of the works on medical subjects, and the New York Academy of Medicine Library has some valuable editions of certain of his works. Some of his other well-known books, each of which is a good-sized octavo volume, bear the following descriptive titles. I give them in English, though, as they are usually found, they are in Latin, 16th century translations of the original German. The World in Miniature, or The Mystery of the World and of Human Medical Science, published at Mayburg, 1609. The Chemical Apocalypse, or The Manifestation of Artificial Chemical Compounds, published in Erfurt in 1624. A Chemico-Philosophic Treatise Concerning Things Natural and Preternatural, Especially Relating to the Metals and the Minerals, published at Frankfurt in 1676. Haleography, or The Science of Salts, a treatise on the preparation, use, and chemical properties of all of the mineral, animal, and vegetable salts, published at Bologna in 1644. The Twelve Keys of Philosophy, Leipzig, 1630. These are of interest to the chemist and physicist rather than to the physician, and it is as a maker of medicine that we are concerned with Valentine here. The great attention aroused in Basil Valentine's work at the Renaissance period can be best realized from the number of manuscript copies and their wide distribution. His books were not all printed at one place, but, on the contrary, in different portions of Europe. The original edition of The Triumphal Chariot of Antimony was published in Leipzig at the early part of the 16th century. The first editions of the other books, however, appeared at places so distant from Leipzig as Amsterdam and Bologna, while various cities of Germany, as Erfurt and Frankfurt, claim the original editions of still other works. Many of the manuscript copies still exist in various libraries in Europe, and while there is no doubt that some unimportant additions to the supposed works of Basil Valentine have come from the attribution to him of scientific treatises of other German writers, the style and the method of the principal works mentioned is entirely too similar not to have been the fruit of a single mind, and that possessed of a distinct investigating genius, setting it far above any of its contemporaries in scientific speculation and observation. The most interesting feature of all of Basil Valentine's writings that are extant is a distinctive tendency to make his observations of special practical utility. His studies in antimony were made mainly with the idea of showing how that substance might be used in medicine. He did not neglect to point out other possible uses, however, and knew the secret of the employment of antimony in order to give sharpness and definition to the impression produced by metal types. It would seem as though he was the first scientist to discuss this subject, and there is even some question of whether printers and type founders did not derive their ideas in this matter from our chemist. Interested though he was in the transmutation of metals, he never failed to try to find and suggest some medicinal use for all of the substances that he investigated. His was no greedy search for gold, and no culmination of investigations with the idea of benefiting only himself. Mankind was always in his mind, and perhaps there is no better demonstration of his fulfillment of the character of the monk than this constant solicitude to benefit others by every bit of investigation that he carried out. For him, with medieval nobleness of spirit, quote, the first part of every work must be the invocation of God, and the last, 
though no less important than the first, must be the utility and fruit for mankind that can be derived from it. End quote. The career of the last of the makers of medicine in the Middle Ages may be summed up briefly in a few sentences that show how thoroughly this old Benedictine was possessed of the spirit of modern science. He believed in observation as the most important source of medical knowledge. He valued clinical experience far above book information. He insisted on personal acquaintanceship on the part of the physician with the drugs he used, and thought nothing more unworthy of a practitioner of medicine. Indeed, he sets it down as almost criminal, than to give remedies of whose composition he was not well aware, and whose effect he did not thoroughly understand. He thought that nature was the most important aid to the physician, much more important than drugs, though he was the first to realize the significance of chemical affinities and he seems to have understood rather well how individual often were the effects obtained from drugs. He was a patient student, a faithful observer, a writer who did not begrudge time and care to the composition of large books on medicine. Yet withal, he was no dry-as-dust scholar, but eminently human in his sympathies with ailing humanity and a strenuous upholder of the dignity of the profession to which he belonged. Scarcely more can be said of anyone in the history of medicine, at least so far as good intentions go, though many accomplish more. None deserve more honor than the Thuringian monk, who we know as Basil Valentine. There are many other of these old-time makers of medicine, of whom nearly the same thing can be said. Basil Valentine is only one of a number of men who worked faithfully and did much both for medical science and professional life during the thousand years from the fall of Rome to the fall of Constantinople, when, according to what used to be commonly accepted opinion, men were not animated by the spirit of research and a fine incentive to do good to men, that we are so likely to think of as belonging exclusively to more modern times. A man whom he greatly influenced, Paracelsus, took up the tradition of scientific investigation where Basil Valentine had left it. His work, though more successfully revolutionary, was not done in such a fine spirit of sympathy with humanity nor with that simplicity of life and purity of intention that characterized the old monk's work. Paracelsus' birth in the year of the discovery of America places him among the makers of the foundations of our modern medicine, and he will be treated of in a volume on The Forefathers in Medicine. End of Part 2 of 2 End of Chapter 14《Appendix I of Old Time Makers of Medicine》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph.《Appendix I — St. Luke the Physician — Part 1 of 2 In the midst of what has been called the higher criticism of the Bible in recent times, one of the long-accepted traditions that has been most strenuously assailed and, indeed, in the minds of many scholars, seemed, for a time at least, quite discredited, was that St. Luke the Evangelist, the author of the Third Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, was a physician, Distinguished authorities in early Christian apologetics have declared that the pillars of primitive Christian history are the genuine epistles of St. Paul, the writings of St. Luke, and the history of Eusebius. It is quite easy to understand, then, that the attack upon the authenticity of the writings usually assigned to St. Luke, which in many minds seemed successful, has been considered of great importance. 
In the very recent time, there has been a decided reaction in this matter. This has come, not so much from Roman Catholics, who have always clung to the traditional view, and whose great biblical students have been foremost in the support of the previously accepted opinion, but from some of the most strenuous of the German higher critics, who now appreciate that destructive, so-called higher criticism, went too far, and that the traditional view not only can be maintained, but is the only opinion that will adequately respond to all the new facts that have been found, and all the recently gathered information, with regard to the relations of events in the olden time. By far the most important contribution to the discussion in recent years came not long since from the pen of Professor Adolf Harnack, the professor of church history in the University of Berlin. Professor Harnack's name is usually cited as that of one of the most destructive of the higher critics. His recent book, however, Luke the Physician, is an entire submission to the old-fashioned viewpoint that the writer of the Third Gospel and of the Acts of the Apostles was a Greek fellow worker of St. Paul, who had been in company for years with Mark and Philip and James, and who had previously been a physician, and was evidently well versed in all the medical lore of that time. Harnack does not merely concede the old position. As might be expected, his rediscussion of the subject clinches the arguments for the traditional view, and makes it impossible ever to call it in question again. It is easy to understand how important are such admissions when we recall how much this traditional view has been assailed and how those who have held it have been accused of old fogyism and lack of scholarship and unwarranted clinging to antiquated notions just because they thought they were of faith and how, lacking in true scholarship, seriously hampering genuine investigation, such conservatism has been declared to be. The question of Luke's having been a physician is an extremely valuable one, and no one in our time is better fitted by early training and long years of study to elucidate it than Professor Harnack. He began his excursions into historical writing years ago as a historian of early Christian medicine, some of his works on medical conditions just before and after Christ are quoted confidently by the distinguished German medical historians. From this department he graduated into the field of the higher criticism. He is eminently in a position, therefore, to state the case with regard to St. Luke fully, and to indicate absolutely the conclusions that should be drawn from the premises of fact, writings, and traditions that we have. He does so in a very striking way. Perhaps no better example of his thoroughly lucid and eminently logical mode of argumentation is to be found than the paragraph in which he states the question. It might be well recommended as an example of terse forcefulness and logical sequence that deserves the emulation of all those who want to write on medical subjects. If we had more of these characteristic qualities of Harnack's style, our medical literature, so-called, would not need to occupy so many pages of print as it does, yet would say more. Here it is. Quote, St. Luke, according to St. Paul, was a physician. When a physician writes a historical work, it does not necessarily follow that his profession shows itself in his writing. Yet it is only natural for one to look for traces of the author's medical profession in such a work. These traces may be of different kinds. 1. The whole character of the narrative may be determined by points of view, aims, and ideals which are more or less medical, disease and its treatment. 2. Marked preference may be shown for stories concerning the healing of diseases, which stories may be given in great number and detail. 3. The language may be colored by the language of physicians, medical technical terms, metaphors of medical character, etc. All these three groups of characteristic signs are found, as we shall see, in the historical work which bears the name of St. Luke. 
Here, however, it may be objected that the subject matter itself is responsible for these traits, so that their evidence is not decisive for the medical calling of the author. Jesus appeared as a great physician and healer. All the evangelists say this of him. Hence it is not surprising that one of them has set this phase of his ministry in the foreground and has regarded it as the most important. Our evangelist need not therefore have been a physician, especially if he were a Greek, seeing that in those days Greeks with religious interests were disposed to regard religion mainly under the category of healing and salvation. This is true, yet such a combination of characteristic signs will compel us to believe that the author was a physician if, for, the description of the particular cases of disease shows distinct traces of medical diagnosis and scientific knowledge. 5. If the language, even where questions of medicine or of healing are not touched upon, it is colored by medical phraseology. And, 6. If in those passages where the author speaks as an eyewitness, medical traits are especially and prominently apparent. These three kinds of tokens are also found in the historical work of our author. It is accordingly proved that it proceeds from the pen of a physician. End quote. The importance of the concession that St. Luke was a physician should be properly appreciated. His whole gospel is written from that standpoint. For him the Savior was the healer, the good physician who went about curing the ills of the body while ministering to people's souls. He has more accounts of miracles of healing than any of the other evangelists. He has taken certain of the stories of the other evangelists who were eyewitnesses, and when they were told in naive and popular language that obscured the real condition that was present, he has retold the story from the physician's standpoint, and thus the miracle becomes clearer than ever. In one case, where Mark has a slur on physicians, Luke eliminates it. In a number of cases, the correction of Mark's popular language in the description of ailments is made in terms that could not have been used except by one thoroughly versed in the Greek medical terminology of the times. As a matter of fact, there seems to be no doubt now that Luke had been, before he became an evangelist, a practicing physician in Malta of considerable experience. His testimony, then, to the miracles is particularly valuable as almost a medical eyewitness. In medical science, St. Luke's time was by no means barren of knowledge. The Alexandrian School of Medicine had done some fine work in its time. It was the first university medical school in the world's history, and there dissection was first practiced regularly and publicly for the sake of anatomy, and even the vivisection of criminals who were supplied by the Ptolemy for human physiology was a part of the school curriculum. A number of important discoveries in brain anatomy are attributed to Herophilus, after whom the torcular Herophili within the skull is named, and who invented the term Calamus scriptorius for certain appearances in the fourth ventricle. His colleague, Erisistratus, the co-founder of this school at Alexandria, did work in pathological anatomy, and laid the foundation for serious study there. For three centuries there is some good worker, at or in connection with Alexandria, whose name is preserved for us in the history of medicine. Other Greek schools of medicine in the East, as, for instance, that of Pergamos, also did excellent work. Galen is the great representative of this school, and he came in the century after St. Luke. A physician educated in Greek medicine at that time would be an excellent position to judge critically of the miracles of healing of the Christ, and it would seem to have been providential that Luke was called for this purpose. The evidence for his membership of our profession will doubtless be interesting to all physicians.
some of the distinctive passages in which Luke's familiarity with medical terms to such an extent that to express his meaning he found himself compelled to use them will appeal at once to these for whom such terms are part of everyday speech the use of the word hydropikos which is not to be met with anywhere else in the new testament nor in the non-medical greek literature of that time though the word is of frequent occurrence as a designation for a person suffering from dropsy and always as in luke the adjective for the substantive in hippocrates dioscorides and galen is a typical example where such vague terms as paralyzed occur luke does not use the familiar word but the medical term that meant stricken with paralysis indicating not any inability to use the limbs but such a one as was due to a stroke of apoplexy we who as physicians have heard of so many cures of paralysis from our friends the Eddyites are prone to ask, as the first question, what sort of a paralysis it was. Luke made inquiries for men who were eyewitnesses, and then has described the scene with such details as convinced him as a physician of the reality of the miracle, and his description was meant to carry conviction to the minds of others. Occasionally, St. Luke uses words which only a physician would be likely to know at all. That is to say, even a man reasonably familiar with medical terminology and medical literature would not be likely to know them unless he had been technically trained. One of these is the word sphudron, a word which is only medical, and is not to be found even in such large Greek lexicons of ordinary words as that of Passau. Sphudron is the anatomical term of the Greco-Alexandrian school for the condylites of the femur. Galen and other medical authors use it, and Luke, in giving the details of the story of the lame man cured, in the third chapter of the Acts, seventh verse, selects it because it exactly expresses the meaning he wished to convey. In this story there are a number of added medical details. These are all evidently arranged so as to give the full medical significance to the miracle. For instance, the man had been lame from birth, literally from the womb of his mother. At this time he was forty years of age, an age at which the spontaneous cure of such an ailment, or indeed any cure of it, could scarcely be expected, if... During the preceding time, there had been no improvement. In the story of the cure of Saul's blindness, Luke says in the Acts that his blindness fell from him like scales. The figure is a typically medical one. The word for fall that is used is, as was pointed out by Hobart, Medical Language of St. Luke, Dublin, 1882, exactly the term that is used for the falling of scales from the body. The term for scales is the specific designation of the particles that fall from the body during certain skin diseases or after certain of the infectious fevers, as in scarlet fever. Hippocrates and Galen have used it in many places. It is distinctively a medical word. In the story of the vision of St. Peter, told also in the Acts, the word ecstasis, from which we derive our word ecstasy, is used. This is the only word St. Luke uses for vision, and he alone uses it. This term is of constant employment in a technical sense in the medical writers of St. Luke's time and before it. When the other evangelists talk of lame people, they use the popular term. This might mean anything or nothing for a physician. Luke uses one of the terms that is employed by physicians when they wish to indicate that for some definite reason there is inability to walk. In the story of the Good Samaritan, there are some interesting details that indicate medical interest on the part of the writer. It is Luke's characteristic story in a typical medical instance. He employs certain words in it that are used only by medical writers.
the use of oil and wine in the treatment of the wounds of the stranger traveler was at one time said to indicate that it could not have been a physician who wrote the story, since the ancients used oil for external applications in such cases, but not wine. More careful search of the old masters of medicine, however, has shown that they used oil and wine, not only internally, but externally. Hippocrates, for instance, has a number of recommendations of this combination for wounds. It is rather interesting to realize this, and especially the wine in addition to the oil, because wine contains enough alcohol to be rather satisfactorily antiseptic. There seems no doubt that wounds that had been bathed in wine, and then had oil poured over them, would be likely to do better than those which were treated in other ways. The wine would cleanse and at least inhibit bacterial growth. The subsequent covering with oil would serve to protect the wound to some degree from external contamination. Sometimes there is an application of medical terms to something extraneous from medicine that makes the phrase employed quite amusing. For instance, when Luke wants to explain how they strengthened the vessel in which they were to sail, he describes the process by the term which was used in medical Greek to mean the splinting of a part, or at least the binding up of it, in such a way as to enable it to be used. The word was quite a puzzle to the commentators until it was pointed out that it was the familiar medical term, and then it was easy to understand. Occasionally, this use of a medical term gives a strikingly accurate significance to Luke's diction. For instance, where other evangelists talk of the Lord looking at a patient or turning to them, Luke uses the expression that was technically employed for a physician's examination of his patient, as if the Lord carefully looked over the ailing people to see their physical needs and then proceeded to cure them. Manifestly in Luke's mind, the most interesting phase of the Lord's life was his exhibition of curative powers, and the Savior was for him the divine healer, the God-physician of bodies as well of souls. There are many little incidents which he relates that emphasize this. For instance, where St. Mark talks about the healing of the man with a withered hand, St. Luke adds the characteristic medical note that it was the right hand. When he tells of the cutting off of the ear of the servant of the high priest of the Garden of Olives, St. Luke takes the story from St. Mark, but adds the information that would appeal to a physician that it was the right ear. Moreover, though all four evangelists record the cutting off of the ear, only St. Luke adds the information that the Lord healed it again. It is as if he were defending the kindly feelings of the divine physician, and as if it would have been inexcusable had he not exerted his miraculous powers of healing on the occasion. It is St. Luke, too, who has constantly distinguished between natural illnesses and cases of possession. This careful distinction alone would point to the author of the third gospel and the Acts as surely a physician. As it is, it confirms beyond all doubt the claim that the writer of these portions of the New Testament was a physician thoroughly familiar with all the medical writings of the time, and probably a physician who had practiced for a long time. Certain miracles of healing are related only by St. Luke, as if he realized better than any of the other evangelists the evidential value that such instances would have for future generations as to the divinity of the personage who worked them. The beautiful story of the raising from death of the son of the widow of nine is probably one of the oftenest quoted passages from St. Luke. It is a charming bit of literature. While it suggests the writer-physician, it makes one almost sure that the other tradition according to which St. Luke was also a painter must be true. The scene is as picturesque as it can be. The Lord and his apostles and the multitudes coming to the gate of the little city
just as in the evening sun the funeral cortege with the widow burying her only son came out of it the approach of the lord to the weeping mother his command to the dead son to arise and the simple words quote, and he gave him back to his mother end quote, constitute as charming a scene as a painter ever tried to visualize besides this Luke alone has the story of the man suffering with dropsy and the woman suffering from weakness. The intensely picturesque quality of many of these scenes that he describes so vividly would indeed seem to place beyond all doubt the old tradition that he was an artist as well as a physician. It is interesting to realize that it is to Luke alone that we owe the account of the well-known message sent by Christ himself to John the Baptist, when John sent his disciples to inquire as to his mission. After describing his ministry, he said, quote, Go and relate to John what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. The lepers are made clean, the dead rise again, to the poor the gospel is preached. End quote. To no one more than to a physician, would that description of his mission appeal as surely divine. To those who care to follow the subject still further, and above all, to read opinions given before the reversal of the verdict of the higher criticism on the Lucan writings, indeed before ever that trial was brought, there is much in Horae Lucane, a biography of St. Luke, by Henry Samuel Baines, Longman's, 1870, that will surely be of interest. He has some interesting quotations which show how thoroughly previous centuries realized all the force of modern arguments. For instance, the following paragraph from Dr. Nathaniel Robinson, a Scotch physician of the 18th century, will illustrate this. Dr. Robinson said, It is manifest from his gospel that Luke was both an acute observer and had even given a professional attention to all our Savior's miracles of healing. Originally, among the Egyptians, divinity and physic were united in the same order of men, so that the priest had the care of souls, and was also the physician. It was much the same under the Jewish economy. But after physic came to be studied by the Greeks, they separated the two professions, that a physician should write the history of our Savior's life was appropriate, as there were diverse mysterious things to be noticed, concerning which his education enabled him to form a becoming judgment. End quote. It is even interesting to realize that St. Luke's tendency to use medical terms has been of definite value in determining the question whether both the Third Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles are by the same man. They have been attributed to St. Luke traditionally, but in the higher criticism some doubt has been thrown on this, and an elaborate hypothesis of dual authorship set up. It has been asserted that it is very improbable on extrinsic grounds that they were both written by one hand and certain intrinsic evidence, changes in the mode of narration, especially the use of the first personal pronoun in the plural in certain passages has been pointed to as making against single authorship. This tendency to deny old-time traditions of authorship with regard to many classical writings was a marked characteristic of the early part of the 19th century, but the close of the century saw practically all of these denials discredited. The 19th century ushered in studies of Homer, with the separatist school perfectly confident in their assertion that the Iliad and the Odyssey were not by the same person, and even that the Iliad itself was the work of several hands. At the beginning of the 20th century, we are quite as sure that both the Iliad and Odyssey were written by the same person, and that the separatists were hurried into a contrary decision not a little by the feeding of the sensation that such a contradiction of previously accepted ideas would create. This is a determining factor in many a supposed novel discovery, 
that it is hard always to discount sufficiently. A thing may be right even though it is old, and most new discoveries it must not be forgotten, that is, most of those announced with a great blare of trumpets do not maintain themselves. The simple argument that the separatists would have to find another poet equal to Homer to write the other poem has done more than anything else to bring their opinion into disrepute. It is much easier to explain certain discrepancies, differences of style, and of treatment of subjects, as well as other minor variants, than to supply another great poet. Most of the works of our older literatures have gone through a similar trial during the over-hasty, superficially critical 19th century. The Nibelungenlied has been attributed to two or three writers instead of one, the Cid, the National Epic of Spain, and the Arthur Legends, the first British epic, have been at least supposed to be amenable to the same sort of criticism. In every case, scholars have gone back to the older traditional view of a single author. The phases of literary and historic criticism, with regard to Luke's writings, are, then, only a repetition of what all our great national classics have gone through from supercilious scholarship during the past hundred years. End of part one of two. Appendix one of Old Time Makers of Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph. Appendix 1, Part 2 of 2. It is not surprising, then, that there should be dual or even triple ascriptions of authorship for various portions of the scriptures, and Luke's writings have, on this score, suffered as much or more even than others, with the possible exception of Moses. It is now definitely settled, however, that the similarities of style between the Acts and the third gospel are too great for them to have come from two different minds. This is especially true, as pointed out by Harnack, in all that regards the use of medical terms. The writer of the Acts and the writer of the third gospel knew Greek from the standpoint of the physician of that time. Each used terms that we find nowhere else in Greek literature except among medical writers. What is thus true for one critical attack on Luke's reputation is also true in another phase of recent higher criticism. It has been said that certain portions of the Acts, which are called the we portions, because the narration changes in them from the third to the first person, were to be attributed to another writer than the one who wrote the narrative portions. Here, once more, the test of the medical words employed has decided the case for Luke's sole authorship. It is evidently an excellent thing to be able to use medical terms properly if one wants to be recognized with certainty later on in history for just what one's business was. It has certainly saved the situation for St. Luke, though there may be some doubt as to the real force of objections thus easily overthrown. It is rather interesting to realize that many scholars of the present generation had allowed themselves to be led away by the German higher criticism from the old tradition with regard to Luke as a physician, and now will doubtless be led back to former views by the leader of German biblical critics. It shows how much more distant things may influence certain people than those nearer home how the hills are green far away. Harnack confesses that the best book ever written on the subject of Luke as a physician, the one that has proved of most value to him, and that he still recommends everyone to read, was originally written in English. It is Hobart's Medical Language of St. Luke, 
written more than a quarter of a century before Harnack. The Germans generally had rather despised what the English were doing in the manner of biblical criticism, and above all in philology. Yet now the acknowledged Corypheus of them all, Harnack, not only admits the superiority of an old-time English book, but confesses that it is the best statement of the subject up to the present time, including his own. He constantly quotes from it, and it is evident that it has been the foundation of all his arguments. It is not the first time that men have fetched from afar what they might have got just as well or better at home. Harnack has made complete the demonstration, then, that the third gospel and the Acts were written by St. Luke, who had been a practicing physician. In spite of this, however, he finds many objections to the Luke narratives and considers that they add very little that is valuable to the contemporary evidence that we have with regard to Christ. He impairs with one hand the value of what he has so lavishly yielded with the other. He finds inconsistencies and discrepancies in the narrative that for him destroy their value as testimony. A lawyer would probably say that this is that very human element in the writings which demonstrates their authenticity and adds to their value as evidence, because it shows clearly the lack of any attempt to do anything more than tell a direct story, as it had come to the narrator. No special effort was made to avoid critical objections founded on details. It was a general impression that was looked for. Sir William Ramsay, in his Luke the Physician and Other Studies in the History of Religion, New York, Armstrong and Sons, 1908, has answered Harnack from the side of the professional critic with much force. He appreciates thoroughly the value of Professor Harnack's book, and above all the reactionary tendency, away from nihilistic so-called higher criticism, which characterized so much of German writing on biblical themes in the 19th century. He says, page 7, quote, this book of Harnack's alone carries Lucan criticism a long step forwards and sets it on a new and higher plane. Never has the unity and character of the book been demonstrated so convincingly and conclusively. The step is made and the plane is reached by the method which is practiced in other departments of literary criticism, visibly, by dispassionate investigation of the work and by discarding fashionable a priori theories. End quote. The distinguished English traveler and writer on biblical subjects points out, however, that in detail many of Harnack's objections to the Lucan narratives are due to insufficient consideration of the circumstances in which they were written and the comparative significance of the details criticized. He says, quote, Harnack lays much stress on the fact that inconsistencies and inexactnesses occur all through acts. Some of these are undeniable, and I have argued that they are to be regarded in the same light as similar phenomena in the poem of Lucretius and in other ancient classical writers, visibly, as proofs that the work never received the final form which Luke intended to give it but was still incomplete when he died. The evident need for a third book to complete the work, together with those blemishes in expression, form the proof. Ramsey's placing of Harnack's writing in general is interesting in this connection. Page 8. Quote, Professor Harnack stands on the border between the 19th and 20th century, his book shows that he is to a certain degree sensitive of, and obedient to, the new spirit, but he is only partially so. The 19th century critical method was false, and is already antiquated. The first century could find nothing real and true that was not accompanied by the marvelous and the supernatural. The 19th century could find nothing real and true that was, which view was right and which was wrong? Was either complete? 
Of these two questions, the second alone is profitable at the present. Both views were right, in a certain way of contemplating. Both views were wrong, in a certain way. Neither was complete. At present, as we are struggling to throw off the fetters which impeded thought in the nineteenth century, it is most important to free ourselves from its prejudices and narrowness. End quote. He adds, pages 26 and 27, quote, There are clear signs of the unfinished state in which this chapter was left by Luke, but some of the German scholar's criticisms show that he has not a right idea of the simplicity of life and equipment that evidently characterize the jailer's house and the prison. The details which he blames as inexact and inconsistent are sometimes most instructive about the circumstances of this provincial town and Roman colonia. But it is never safe to lay much stress on small points of inexactness or inconsistency in any author. One finds such faults even in the works of modern scholarship if one examines them in the microscopic fashion in which Luke is studied here. I think I can find them in the author Harnack himself. His point of view sometimes varies in a puzzling way. End quote. As a matter of fact, Harnack, as pointed out by Ramsey, was evidently working himself more and more out of the old conclusion as to the lack of authenticity in the Lucan writings into an opinion ever more and more favorable to Luke. For instance, in a notice of his own book, published in the Theologische Litera Zeitung, quote, he speaks far more favorably about the trustworthiness and credibility of Luke as being generally in a position to acquire and transmit reliable information and as having proved himself able to take advantage of his position. Harnack was gradually working his way to a new plane of thought. His later opinion is more favorable. End quote. Ramsey also points out that Professor Gifford, one of our American biblical critics, had felt compelled by the geographical and historical evidence to abandon in part the older unfavorable criticism of Luke and to admit that the Acts is more trustworthy than previous critics allowed. Above all, quote, he saw that it was a living piece of literature written by one author, end quote. In a word, Luke is being vindicated in every regard. Some of the supposed inaccuracies of Luke vanish when careful investigation is made. Some of his natural history details, for instance, have been impugned and the story of the viper that fastened itself upon St. Paul in Malta has been cited as an example of a story that would not have been told in that way by a man who knew medicine, and the related sciences in Luke's time. Because the passage illustrates a number of phases of the discussion with regard to Luke's language, I make a rather long quotation from Ramsey. Quote, Take as a specimen with which to finish off this paper the passage Acts 28, 9 at sequence, which is very fully discussed by Harnack twice. He argues that the true meaning of the passage was not understood until medical language was compared, when it was shown that the Greek word by which the act of the viper to Paul's hand is described implies bit and not merely fastened upon. But it is a well-assured fact that the viper, a poisonous snake, only strikes, fixes the poisoned fangs on the flesh for a moment, and withdraws its head instantly. Its action could never be what is attributed by Luke, the eyewitness to this Maltese viper, that it hung from Paul's hand and was shaken off into the fire by him. On the other hand, constrictors, which have no poison fangs, cling in the way described, but as a rule do not bite. Are we, then, to understand in spite of the medical style and the authority of Professor Blass, who translates... Mamordit in his edition, 
that the viper fastened upon the apostle's hand? Then, the very name viper is a difficulty. Was Luke mistaken about the kind of snake which he saw? A trained medical man in ancient times was usually a good authority about serpents, to which great respect was paid in ancient medicine and custom. Mere verbal study is here utterly at fault. We can make no progress without turning to the realities and facts of Maltese natural history. A correspondent obligingly informed me some years ago that Mr. Brian Hook of Farnham, Surrey, who, my correspondent assures me, is a thoroughly good naturalist, had found in Malta a small snake, Cornella austriaca, which is rare in England, but common in many parts of Europe. It is a constrictor, without poison fangs, which would cling to the hand or arm, as Luke describes. It is similar in size to the viper, and so like in markings and general appearance, that Mr. Hook, when he caught his specimen, thought he was killing a viper. My friend, Professor J. W. H. Trail, of Aberdeen, whom I consulted, replied that Cornella lovis, or Austriaca, is known in Sicily and the adjoining islands, but he can find no evidence of its existence in Malta. It is known to be rather irritable, and to fix its small teeth so firmly into the human skin as to need a little force to pull it off, though the teeth are too short to do any real injury to the skin. Coronella is, at a glance, very much like a viper, and in the flames it would not be closely examined. While it is not reported as found in Malta except by Mr. Hook, two species are known there belonging to the same family and having similar habits, Leopardinus and Zemenis, or Colubur gemonensis. The coloring of Coronella leopardinus would be the most likely to suggest a viper. The observations justify Luke entirely. We have here a snake so closely resembling a viper as to be taken for one by a good naturalist until he had caught and examined a specimen. It clings, and yet it also bites without doing harm. That the Maltese rustics should mistake this harmless snake for a venomous one is not strange. Many uneducated people have the idea that all snakes are poisonous, in varying degrees, just as the vulgar often firmly believe that toads are poisonous. Every detail as related by Luke is natural, and in accordance with the facts of the country. End quote. In a word, then, the whole question as to Luke's authority as a writer, as an eyewitness of many things, and as the relator of many others with regard to which he had obtained the testimony of eyewitnesses, is fully vindicated. Twenty years ago, many scholars were prone to doubt this whole question. Ten years ago, most of them were convinced that the Luke traditions were not justified by recent investigation. Now we have come back once more to the complete acceptance of the old traditions. Perhaps the most unfortunate characteristic of much 19th century criticism in all departments, even those strictly scientific, was the marked tendency to reject previous opinions for new ones. Somehow, men felt themselves so far ahead of old-time writers and thinkers that they concluded they must hold opinions different from their ancestors. In nearly every case, the new ideas that they evolved by supposedly newer methods were not standing the test of time and further study. There had been a continuous belief in men's minds, having its bias very probably on a passage in one of St. Peter's epistles, that the earth would dissolve by fire. This was openly contradicted all during the 19th century, and the time when the earth would freeze up definitely calculated by our mathematicians. Now after having studied radioactivity, and learned from the physicists that the earth is heating up and will eventually get too hot for life, we calmly go back to the old Petron Declaration. Some of the most distinguished of the German biologists of the present day, 
Such men as Driesch and others calmly tell us that the edifice erected by Darwin will have to come down because of newly discovered evidence, and indeed some of them go so far as to declare that Darwinism was a crude hypothesis, very superficial in its philosophical aspects, and therefore acceptable to a great many people who, because it was easy to understand, and was very different from what our fathers had believed, hastened to accept it. Nothing shows the necessity for being conservative in the matter of new views in science, or ethics, or religion, more than the curious transition state in which we are with regard to many opinions at the present time, with a distinct tendency toward reaction to older views that a few years ago were thought quite untenable. We are rather proud of the advance that we are supposed to be making along many lines in science and scholarship, and yet over and over again, after years of work, we prove to have been following a wrong lead, and must come back to where we started. This has been the way of man from the beginning, and doubtless will continue. The present generation are having this curious regression that follows supposed progress strongly emphasized for them. End of Part 2 of 2 End of Appendix 1《Appendix Two of Old Time Makers of Medicine》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marsitich, September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph.《Appendix Two》Science at the Medieval Universities Part 1 of 2. With the growth of interest in science and in nature study in our own day, one of the expressions that is probably oftenest heard is surprise that the men of preceding generations, and especially university men, did not occupy themselves more with the world around them and with the phenomena that are so tempting to curiosity. Science is usually supposed to be comparatively new, and nature study only a few generations old. Men are supposed to have been so much interested in book knowledge, and in speculations, and theories of many kinds, that they neglected the realities of life around them, while spinning fine webs of theory. Previous generations, of course, have indulged in theory, but then our own generation is not entirely free from that amusing occupation. Nothing could well be less true, however, than that the men of preceding generations were not interested in science, even in the sense of physical science, or that nature study is new, or that men were not curious and did not try to find out all they could about the phenomena of the world around them. The medieval universities and the schoolmen who taught in them have been particularly blamed for their failure to occupy themselves with realities instead of with speculation. We are coming to realize their wonderful zeal for education, the large number of students they attracted, the enthusiasm of their students, since they made so many handwritten copies of the books of their masters, the devotion of the teachers themselves, who wrote at much greater length than do our professors even now, and on the most abstruse subjects, so that it is all the more surprising to think they should have neglected science. The thought of our generation in the matter, however, is founded entirely on an assumption. Those who know anything about the writers of the Middle Ages at first hand are not likely to think of them as neglectful of science, even in our sense of the term. Those who know them at second hand are, however, very sure in the matter. The assumption is due to the neglect of history that came in the 17th and 18th centuries. We have many other similar assumptions because of the neglect of many phases of mental development and applied science at this time. For instance, most of us are very proud of our modern hospital development and think of this as a great humanitarian evolution of applied medical science. 
We are very likely to think that this is the first time in the world's history that the building of hospitals has been brought to such a climax of development, and that the houses for the ailing in the olden time were mere refuges, prone to become death traps, and at most makeshifts for the solution of the problem of the care of the ailing poor. This is true for the hospitals of the 17th and 18th centuries, but it is not true at all for the hospitals of the 13th and 14th and 15th centuries. Miss Nutting and Miss Dock, in their History of Nursing, have called attention to the fact that the lowest period in hospital development is during the 18th and early 19th centuries. Hospitals were little better than prisons. They had narrow windows, were ill-provided with light and air and hygienic arrangements, and, in general, were all that we should imagine old-time hospitals to be. The hospitals of the earlier time, however, had fine high ceilings, large windows, abundant light and air, excellent arrangements for the privacy of patients, and in general were as worthy of the architects of the earlier times as the municipal buildings, the cathedrals, the castles, the university buildings, and every other form of construction that the late medieval centuries devoted themselves to. The trouble with those who assume that there was no study of science and practically no attention to nature study in the Middle Ages is that they know nothing at all at first hand about the works of the men who wrote in the medieval period. They have accepted their declarations with regard to the absolute dependence of the scholastics on authority, their almost divine worship of Aristotle, their utter readiness to accept authoritative assertions provided they came with the stamp of a mighty name, and then their complete lack of attention to observation and above all to experiment. Nothing could well be more ridiculous than this ignorant assumption of knowledge with regard to the great teachers at the medieval universities. Just as soon as there is definite knowledge of what these great teachers wrote and taught, not only does the previous mood of blame for them not paying much more attention to science and nature at once disappear, but it gives place to the heartiest admiration for the work of these great thinkers. It is easy to appreciate, then, what Professor Saintsbury said in a recent volume on the 13th century, quote, and there have even been, in these latter days, some graceless ones who have asked whether the science of the 19th century, after an equal interval, will not be of any more positive value, whether it will not have even less comparative interest than that which appertains to the scholasticism of the 13th. End quote. Three men were the great teachers in the medieval universities at their prime. They have been read and studied with interest ever since. They wrote huge tomes, but men have poured over them in every generation. They were Albertus Magnus, the teacher of the other two, Thomas Aquinas, and Roger Bacon. All three of them were together at the University of Paris shortly after the middle of the 13th century. Anyone who wants to know anything about the attitude of mind of the medieval universities their professors and students, and of all the intellectual world of the time, toward science and observation and experiment, should read the books of these men. Any other mode of getting at any knowledge of the real significance of the science of this time is mere pretense. These constitute the documents behind any scientific history of the development of science at this time. It is extremely interesting to see the attitude of these men with regard to authority. In Albert's tenth book of his Summa, in which he catalogues and describes all the trees, plants, and herbs known in his time, he observes, quote, All that is here set down is the result of our own experience, or has been borrowed from authors whom we know to have written what their personal experience has confirmed, for in these matters experience alone can be of certainty. Quote. In his impressive Latin phase, quote, 
experimentum solum certificat in talibus, end quote, with regard to the study of nature in general, he was quite as emphatic. He was a theologian as well as a scientist, yet in his treatise on the heavens and the earth, he declared that, quote, In studying nature, we have not to inquire how God the Creator may, as he freely wills, use his creatures to work miracles and thereby show forth his power. We have rather to inquire what nature with its imminent causes can naturally bring to pass. End quote. Just as striking quotations on this subject might be made from Roger Bacon. Indeed, Bacon was quite impatient with the scholars around him who talked overmuch, did not observe enough, depended to excess on authority, and in general did as mediocre scholars always do, made much fuss on second-hand information, plus some flimsy speculations of their own. Friar Bacon, however, had one great pupil whose work he thoroughly appreciated because it exhibited the opposite qualities. This was Petrus. We have come to know him as Peregrinus, whose observations on magnetism have excited so much attention in recent years with the republications of his epistle on the subject. It is really a monograph on magnetism written in the 13th century. Roger Bacon's opinion of it and of its author furnishes us the best possible index of his attitude of mind towards observation and experiment in science. Quote, I know of only one person who deserves praise for his work in experimental philosophy, for he does not care what the discourses of men and their wordy warfare, but quietly and diligently pursues the works of wisdom. Therefore, what others grope after blindly, as bats in the evening twilight, this man contemplates in their brilliancy, because he is a master of experiment. Hence, he knows all of natural science, whether pertaining to medicine and alchemy, or to matters celestial or terrestrial. He has worked diligently in the smelting of ores, as also in the working of minerals. He is thoroughly acquainted with all sorts of arms and implements used in military service and in hunting, besides which he is skilled in agriculture and the measurement of lands. It is impossible to write a useful or correct treatise in experimental philosophy without mentioning this man's name. Moreover, he pursues knowledge for its own sake, for if he wished to obtain royal favor, he could easily find sovereigns who would honor and enrich him. End quote. Similar expressions might be readily quoted from Thomas Aquinas, but his works are so easy to secure, and his whole attitude of mind so well known, that it scarcely seems worth while taking space to do so. Aquinas is still studied very faithfully in many universities, and within the last few years, one of his great textbooks on philosophy has been replaced in the curriculum of Oxford University, in which it occupied a prominent position in the long ago, as a work that may be offered for examination in the Department of Philosophy. It is with regard to him particularly that there has been the greatest revulsion of feeling in recent years, and a recognition of the fact that here was a great thinker familiar with all that was known in the physical sciences, and who had this knowledge constantly in his mind when he drew his conclusions with regard to philosophical and theological questions. It used to be the fashion to make little of the medieval scholars for the high estimation in which they held Aristotle. Occasionally, even yet one hears narrowly educated men I am sorry to say much more frequently scientific specialists than others, talk deprecatingly of this ardent devotion to Aristotle. No one who knows anything about Aristotle ever indulges in such an exhibition of ignorance of the realities of the history of philosophy and science. To know Aristotle well is to think of him as probably possessed of the greatest human mind that ever existed. 
We do not need to go back to the Middle Ages to be confirmed in that opinion. Modern scientists who know their science well, but who also know Aristotle well, and who are ardent worshippers at his shrine, are not hard to find. Romanes, the great English biologist at the end of the 19th century, said, quote, It appears to me that there can be no question that Aristotle stands forth not only as the greatest figure in antiquity, but as the greatest intellect that has ever appeared upon this earth. End quote. Before Romanes, George H. Lewes, in his interesting monograph in the history of thought, Aristotle, a chapter in the history of science, is quite as complementary to the great Greek thinker. We may say that Lewes was by no means partial to Aristotle, anything but inclined to accept authority as a value in philosophy, he had been rendered impatient by the fact that so much of the history of philosophy was dominated by Aristotle, and it was only that the panegyric was forced from him by careful study of all that the Staggerite wrote that he said, quote, History gazed on him with wonder. His intellect was piercing and comprehensive. His attainments surpassed those of every philosopher. His influence has been excelled only by the founders of religion. His vast and active intelligence for twenty centuries held the world in awe. End quote. Professor Osborne, whose scholarly study of the theory of evolution down the ages, from the Greeks to Darwin, rather startled the world of science by showing not only how old was the theory of evolution, but how frequently it had been stated, and how many of them anticipated phases of our own thought in the matter, pays a high compliment to the great Greek scientist. He says, quote, Aristotle clearly states and rejects the theory of the origin of adaptive structures in animals, altogether similar to that of Darwin. End quote. He then quotes certain passages from Aristotle's Physics and says, quote, These passages seem to contain absolute evidence that Aristotle had substantially the modern conception of the evolution of life from a primordial soft mass of living matter to the most perfect forms, and that even in these he believed that evolution was incomplete for they were progressing to higher forms. End quote. Modern French scientists are particularly laudatory in their estimation of Aristotle. The group of biologists, Buffon, Cuvier, Saint Hilaire, and others who called world attention to French science and its attainments about a century ago, are all of them on record in highest praise of Aristotle. Cuvier said, quote, I cannot read his work without being ravished with astonishment. It is impossible to conceive how a single man was able to collect and compare the multitude of facts implied in the rules and aphorisms contained in this book. End quote. It is possible, however, to get opinions ardently laudatory of Aristotle from the serious students of any nation provided only they know their Aristotle. Sir William Hamilton, the Scotch professor, said, quote, Aristotle's seal is upon all the sciences. His speculations have determined those of all subsequent thinkers. End quote. Hegel, the German philosophic writer, is not less outspoken in his praise. Quote, Aristotle penetrated the whole universe of things and subjected them to intelligence. End quote. Kant, who is often said to have influenced our modern thinking more than any other in recent generations, has his compliment for Aristotle. It relates particularly to that branch of philosophy with which Kant had most occupied himself. The Konigsberg philosopher said, quote, Logic since Aristotle, like geometry since Euclid, is a finished science. End quote. I do not want to tire you, or I could quote many other authorities who proclaim Aristotle the genius of the race. 
They would include poets like Dante and Goethe, scholars like Cicero and Anton, literary men like Lessing and Reich, and many others. The scholars of the Middle Ages, far from condemnation for their devotion to Aristotle, deserve the highest praise for it. If they had done nothing else but appreciate Aristotle, as our greatest modern scholars have done, that of itself would proclaim their profound scholarship. The medieval writers are often said to have been uncritical in their judgment, but in their lofty estimation of Aristotle they displayed the finest possible critical judgment. On the contrary, the generations who made much of the opportunity to minimize medieval scholarship because of its worship at the shrine of Aristotle must themselves fall under the suspicion at least of either not knowing Aristotle or of not thinking deeply about the subjects with regard to which he wrote. For in all the world's history, the rule has been that whenever men have thought deeply about a subject and know what Aristotle has written with regard to that subject, they have the liveliest admiration for the great Greek thinker. This is true for philosophy, logic, metaphysics, politics, ethics, dramatics, but it is also quite as true for physical science. He lacked our knowledge, though not nearly to the degree that is usually thought, and he had a marvelous accumulation of information, but he had a breadth of view and a thoroughness of appreciation with a power of penetration that make his opinions worth while knowing even on scientific subjects in our enlightened age. As for the supposed swearing by Aristotle, in the sense of literally accepting his opinions without daring to examine them critically, which is so constantly asserted to have been the habit of the medieval scholars and teachers, it is extremely difficult, in the light of the expressions which we have from them, to understand how this false impression arose. Aristotle, they thoroughly respected. They constantly referred to his works, but so has every thinking generation ever since. Whenever he had made a declaration, they would not accept the contradiction of it without a good reason, but whenever they had good reasons, Aristotle's opinion was at once rejected without compunction. Albertus Magnus, for instance, said, quote, Whoever believes that Aristotle was a god must also believe that he never erred, but if we believe that Aristotle was a man, then doubtless he was liable to err just as we are. End quote. A number of direct contradictions of Aristotle we have from Albert. A well-known one is that with regard to Aristotle's assertion that lunar rainbows appeared only twice in fifty years. Albert declared that he himself had seen two in a single year. Indeed, it seems very clear that the whole trend of thought among the great teachers of the time was away from the acceptance of scientific conclusions on authority unless there was good evidence for them available. They were quite as impatient as the scientists of our time with the constant putting forward of Aristotle as if that settled a scientific question. Roger Bacon wanted the Pope to forbid the study of Aristotle because his works were leading men astray from the study of science, his authority being looked upon as so great that men did not think for themselves but accepted his assertions. Smaller men are always prone to do this, and indeed it constitutes one of the difficulties in the way of advance in scientific knowledge at all times, as Roger Bacon himself pointed out. These are the sort of expressions that are to be expected from Friar Bacon from what we know of other parts of his work. His Opus Tertium was written at the request of Pope Clement IV, because the Pope had heard many interesting accounts of what the great 13th century teacher and experimenter was doing at the University of Oxford, and wished to learn for himself the details of his work. Bacon starts out with the principle that there are four grounds of human ignorance. These are, quote, First, 
trust in inadequate authority. Second, that force of custom which leads men to accept without properly questioning what has been accepted before their time. Third, the placing of confidence in the assertions of the inexperienced. And fourth, the hiding of one's own ignorance behind the parade of superficial knowledge, so that we are afraid to say, I do not know. End quote. Professor Henry Morley, a careful student of Bacon's writings, said with regard to these expressions of Bacon, quote, no part of that ground has yet been cut away from beneath the feet of students, although six centuries have passed. We still make sheep walks of second, third, and fourth, and fiftieth hand references to authority. Still we are the slaves of habit. Still we are found following too frequently the untaught crowd. Still we flinch from the righteous and wholesome phrase, I do not know and acquiesce actively in the opinion of others that we know what we appear to know. End quote. In his Opus Magis, Bacon had previously given abundant evidence of his respect for the experimental method. There is a section of this work which bears the title Scientia Experimentalis. In this, Bacon affirms that, quote, without experiment, nothing can be adequately known. An argument may prove the correctness of a theory, but does not give the certitude necessary to remove all doubt. Nor will the mind repose in the clear view of truth, unless it finds its way by means of experiment. End quote. To this he later added in his Opus Tertium, quote, the strongest argument proves nothing so long as the conclusions are not verified by experience. Experimental science is the queen of sciences and the goal of all speculation. End quote. It is no wonder that Dr. Wewell, in his History of the Inductive Sciences, should have been unstinted in his praise of Roger Bacon's work and writings. In a well-known passage, he says, of the Opus Magis, quote, Roger Bacon's Opus Magis is the encyclopedia and novum organon of the 13th century, a work equally wonderful with regard to its wonderful scheme and to the special treatises by which the outlines of the plans are filled up. The professed object of the work is to urge the necessity of a reform in the mode of philosophizing, to set forth the reasons why knowledge had not made greater progress, to draw back attention to the sources of knowledge which had been unwisely neglected, to discover other sources which were yet almost untouched, and to animate men in the undertaking of a prospect of the vast advantages which it offered. In the development of this plan, all the leading portions of science are expanded in the most complete shape, which they had at that time assumed, and improvements of a very wide and striking kind are proposed in some of the principal branches of study. Even if the work had no leading purposes, it would have been highly valuable as a treatise of the most solid knowledge and soundest speculations of the time. Even if it had contained no such details, it would have been a work most remarkable for its general views and scope. End quote. As a matter of fact, the universities of the Middle Ages, far from neglecting science, were really scientific universities. Because the universities of the early 19th century occupied themselves almost exclusively with languages, and especially formed students' minds by means of classical studies, men in our time seem to be prone to think that such linguistic studies form the main portion of the curriculum of the universities in all the old times, and particularly in the Middle Ages. The study of the classic languages, however, came into university life only after the Renaissance. Before that, the undergraduates of the universities had occupied themselves almost entirely with science. It was quite as much trouble to introduce linguistic studies into the old universities 
in the Renaissance time to replace science, as it was to secure room for science by pushing out the classics in the modern time. Indeed, the two revolutions in education are strikingly similar when studied in detail. Men who had been brought up on science before the Renaissance were quite sure that that formed the best possible means of developing the mind. In the early 19th century, men who had been formed on the classics were quite as sure that science could not replace them with any success. End of part one of two. Appendix 2 of Old Time Makers of Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph. Appendix 2 Science at the Medieval Universities. Part 2 of 2. There is no pretense that this view of the medieval universities is a new idea in the history of education. Those who have known the old universities at first hand by the study of the actual books of their professors and by familiarity with their courses of study have not been inclined to make the mistake of thinking that the medieval university neglected science. Professor Huxley in his inaugural address as rector of Aberdeen University some thirty years ago, stated very definitely his recognition of medieval devotion to science. His words are well worth remembering by all those who are accustomed to think of our time as the first in which the study of science was taken up seriously in our universities. Professor Huxley said, quote, the scholars of the medieval universities seem to have studied grammar, logic, and rhetoric, arithmetic and geometry, astronomy, theology, and music. Thus their work, however imperfect and faulty, judged by modern lights, it may have been, brought them face to face with all the leading aspects of the many-sided mind of man for these studies did really contain, at any rate, in embryo, sometimes it may be in caricature, what we now call philosophy, mathematical and physical science, and art. And I doubt if the curriculum of any modern university shows so clear and generous a comprehension of what is meant by culture, as this old trivium and quad trivium does. End quote. It would be entirely a mistake, however, to think that these great writers and teachers who influenced the medieval universities so deeply and whose works were the textbooks of the universities for centuries after only had the principles of physical and experimental science and did not practically apply them. As a matter of fact, their works are full of observation. Once more, the presumption that they wrote only nonsense with regard to science comes from those who do not know their writings at all, while great scientists who have taken the pains to study their works are enthusiastic in praise. Humboldt, for instance, says of Albertus Magnus, after reading some of his works with care, quote, Albertus Magnus is equally active and influential in promoting the study of natural science and of the Aristotelian philosophy. His works contain some exceedingly acute remarks on the organic structure and physiology of plants. One of his works bearing the title of Liber Cosmographicus de Natura Locorum is a species of physical geography. I have found it in considerations on the dependence of temperature concurrently on latitude and elevation and on the effect of different angles of the sun's rays in heating the ground which have excited my surprise. End quote. It is with regard to physical geography, of course, that Humboldt is himself a distinguished authority. Humboldt's expression that he found some exceedingly acute remarks on the organic structure and physiology of plants in Albert the Great's writings will prove a great surprise to many people. Meyer, the German historian of botany, 
however, has re-echoed Humboldt's praise with emphasis. The extraordinary erudition and originality of Albert's treatise on plants drew from Meyer the comment, quote, No botanist who lived before Albert can be compared with him unless Theophrastus, with whom he was not acquainted, and after him none has painted nature in such living colors or studied it so profoundly until the time of Conrad Gessner and Cesalpino. These men, it may be remarked, come three centuries after Albert's time. A ready idea of Albert's contributions to physical science can be obtained from his life by Sigart, which has been translated into English by Dixon and was published in London in 1870. Pagel, in Pushman's History of Medicine, already referred to, gives a list of the books written by Albert on scientific matters, with some comments which are eminently suggestive, and furnish solid basis for the remark that I have made, that men's minds were occupied with nearly the same problems in science in the 13th century as we are now, while the conclusions they came to were not very different from ours, though reached so long before us. This catalogue of Albertus Magnus' works show very well his own interest and that of his generation in physical science of all kinds. There were eight treatises on Aristotle's physics and on the underlying principles of natural philosophy and of energy and of movement. Four treatises concerning the heavens and the earth, one on physical geography which also contains, according to Pagel, Numerous Suggestions on Ethnography and Physiology. There are two treatises on Generation and Corruption, six books on Meteors, five books on Minerals, three books on the Soul, two books on the Intellects, a treatise on Nutritives, and then a treatise on the Senses, and other on the Memory and on the Imagination. All the phases of the Biological Sciences were especially favored subjects of his study. There is a treatise on the motion of animals, a treatise in six books on vegetables and plants, a treatise on breathing things, a treatise on sleep and walking, a treatise on youth and old age, and a treatise on life and death. His treatise on minerals contains, according to Pagel, a description of ninety-five different kinds of precious stones. Albert's volumes on plants were reproduced with Meyer, the German botanist, as editor. Berlin, 1867. All of Albert's books are available in modern editions. Pagel says of Albertus that, quote, his profound scholarship, his boundless industry, the almost incontrollable impulse of his mind after universality of knowledge, the many-sidedness of his literary productivity, and finally, the almost universal recognition which he received from his contemporaries and succeeding generations stamp him as one of the most imposing characters and one of the most wonderful phenomena of the Middle Ages. End quote. In another passage, Pagel has said, quote, While Albert was a churchman and an ardent devotee of Aristotle in matters of natural phenomena, he was relatively unprejudiced and presented an open mind. He thought that he must follow Hippocrates and Galen rather than Aristotle and Augustine in medicine and in the natural sciences. We must concede it a special subject of praise for Albert that he distinguished very strictly between natural and supernatural phenomena. The former he considered as entirely the object of the investigation of nature, the latter he handed over to the realm of metaphysics. End quote. Roger Bacon is, however, the one of these three great teachers who shows us how thoroughly practical was the scientific knowledge of the universities and how much it led to important useful discoveries in applied science and to anticipations of what is most novel even in our present-day sciences. Some of these, indeed, are so startling that only that we know them, not by tradition, but from his works, where they may be readily found without any doubt of their authenticity, we should be sure to think 
that they must be the result of later commentators' ideas. Bacon was very much interested in astronomy, and not only suggested the correction of the calendar, but also a method by which it could be kept from wandering away from the actual date thereafter. He discovered many of the properties of lenses, and is said to have invented spectacles, and announced very emphatically that light did not travel instantaneously, but moved with a definite velocity. He is sometimes said to have invented gunpowder, but of course he did not, though he studied this substance in various forms very carefully, and drew a number of conclusions in his observations. He was sure that some time or other man would learn to control the energies exhibited by explosives, and then he would be able to accomplish many things that seemed quite impossible under present conditions. He said, for instance, quote, Art can construct instruments of navigation, such that the largest vessels governed by a single man will traverse rivers and seas more rapidly than if they were filled with oarsmen. One may also make carriages which, without the aid of any animal, will run with remarkable swiftness. End quote. In these days when the automobile is with us, and when the principal source of energy for motor purposes is derived from explosives of various kinds, this expression of Roger Bacon represents a prophecy marvelously surprising in its fulfillment. It is no wonder that the book whence it comes bears the title De Secretis Artis et Naturae. Roger Bacon even went to the extent, however, of declaring that man would sometime be able to fly. He was even sure that, with sufficient pains, he could himself construct a flying machine. He did not expect to use explosives for his motor power, however, but thought that a windlass properly arranged, worked by hand, might enable a man to make sufficient movement to carry himself aloft, or at least to support himself in the air, if there were enough surface to enable him to use his lifting power to advantage. He was in intimate relations by letter, with many other distinguished inventors and investigators besides Peregrinus, and was a source of incentive and encouragement to them all. The more one knows of Aquinas, the more surprise there is at his anticipation of many modern scientific ideas. At the conclusion of a course on cosmology, delivered at the University of Paris, he said that, quote, nothing at all would ever be reduced to nothingness. End quote. Nihil omnino in nihilium redigitur. He was teaching the doctrine that man could not destroy matter, and God would not annihilate it. In other words, he was teaching the indestructibility of matter even more emphatically than we do. He saw the many changes that take place in material substances around us, but he taught that these were only changes of form, and not substantial changes, and that the same amount of matter always remained in the world. At the same time, he was teaching that the forms in matter, by which he meant the combinations of energies which distinguish the various kinds of matter, are not destroyed. In other words, he was anticipating not vaguely, but very clearly and definitely, the conservation of energy. His teaching with regard to the composition of matter was very like that now held by physicists. He declared that matter was composed of two principles, prime matter and form. By forma, he meant the dynamic element in matter, while by materia prima, he meant the underlying substratum of material, the same in every substance, but differentiated by the dynamics of matter. It used to be the custom to make fun of these medieval scientists for believing in the transmutation of metals. It may be said that all three of these greatest teachers did not hold the doctrine of the transmutation of metals in the exaggerated way in which it appealed to many of their contemporaries. The theory of matter and form, however, gave a philosophical basis for the idea that one kind of matter might be changed into another. We no longer think that notion absurd, 
Sir William Ramsay has actually succeeded in changing one element into another, and radium and helium are seen changing into each other. Until now, we are quite ready to think of transmutation placidly. The philosopher's stone used to seem a great absurdity, until our recent experience with radium, which is to some extent at least the philosopher's stone, since it brings about the change of certain supposed elements into others. A distinguished American chemist said not long ago that he would like to extract all the silver from a large body of lead ore in which it occurs so commonly, and then come back after twenty years and look for further traces of silver, for he felt sure that they would be found, and that lead ore is probably always producing silver in small quantities, and copper ore is producing gold. Most people will be inclined to ask where the fruits of this undergraduate teaching of science are to be found. They are inclined to presume that science was a closed book to the men and women of that time. It is not hard, however, to point the effect of the scientific training in the writings of the times. Dante is a typical university man of the period, he was at several Italian universities, was at Paris, and perhaps at Oxford. His writings are full of science. Professor Coons of Wesleyan, in his book The Treatment of Nature in Dante, has pointed out how much Dante knows of science and of nature. Few of the poets, not only of his own, but of any time, have known more. There are only one or two writers of poetry in our time who go with so much confidence to nature and the scientific interpretation of her for figures for their poetry. The astronomy, the botany, the zoology of Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas, Dante knew very well and used confidently for figurative purposes. Anyone who is inclined to think nature study a new idea in the world forgets, or has never known, his Dante. The birds and the bees, the flowers, the leaves, the varied aspects of clouds and sea, the phenomena of phosphorescence, the intimate habits of bird and beast, and the ways of the plants, as well as all the appearances of the heavens, Dante knew very well, and in a detail that is quite surprising, when we recall how little nature study is supposed to have attracted the men of his time. Only that his readers appreciated it at all, Dante would surely not have used his scientific erudition so constantly. So much for the undergraduate department of the universities of the Middle Ages, and the view is absolutely fair, for these were the men to whom the students flocked by thousands. They were teaching science, not literature. They were discussing physics as well as metaphysics psychology and its phenomena, as well as philosophy, observation and experiment, as well as logic, the ethical sciences, economics, practically all the scientific ideas that were needed in their generation, and that generation saw the rise of the universities, the finishing of the cathedrals, the building of magnificent town halls and castles and beautiful municipal buildings of many kinds, including hospitals, the development of the Hansa League in commerce, and of wonderful manufacturers of all the textiles, the arts and crafts, as well as the most beautiful bookmaking and art and literature. We could be quite sure that the men who solved all the other problems so well could not have been absurd only in their treatment of science. Anyone who reads their books will be quite sure of that. While most people might be ready, then, to confess that possibly Huxley was not mistaken with regard to the undergraduate development of the universities, most of them would feel sure that at least the graduate departments were sadly deficient in accomplishment. Once more, this is entirely an assumption. The facts are all against any such idea. There were three graduate departments in most of the universities— theology, law, and medicine. While physical scientists are usually not cognizant of it apparently, theology is a science, 
a department of knowledge developed scientifically, and most of these medieval universities did more for its scientific development than the schools of any other period. Quite as much may be said for philosophy, for there are many who hesitate to attribute any scientific quality to modern developments in this matter. As for law, this is the great period of the foundation of scientific law development. The English common law was formulated by Bracton. The deep foundations of basic French and Spanish law were laid, and canon law acquired a definite scientific character, which it has always to retain. All this was accomplished almost entirely by the professors in the law departments of the universities. It was in medicine, however, where most people would be quite sure without any more ado that nothing worthwhile talking about was being done, that the great triumphs of graduate teaching at the medieval universities were secured. Here more than anywhere else is there room for supreme surprise at the quite unheard of anticipations of our modern medicine and, stranger still, as it may seem, of our modern surgery. The law regulating the practice of medicine in the two Sicilies about the middle of the 13th century shows us the high standard of medical education. Students were required to have three years of preliminary study at the university, four years in the medical department, and then practice for a year with a physician before they were allowed to practice for themselves. If they wanted to practice surgery, an extra year in the study of anatomy was required. I published the text of this law, which was issued by Emperor Frederick II about 1241, in the Journal of the American Medical Association three years ago. It also regulated the practice of pharmacy. Drugs were manufactured under the inspection of the government, and there was a heavy penalty for substitution or for the sale of old inert drugs, or improperly prepared pharmaceutical materials. If the government inspector violated his obligations as to the oversight of drug preparations, the penalty was death. Nor was this law of Emperor Frederick an exception. We have the charters of a number of medical schools issued by the popes during the next century, all of which require seven years or more of university study, four of them in the medical department, before the doctor's degree could be obtained. When new medical schools were founded, they had to have professors from certain well-recognized schools on their staff at the beginning in order to assure proper standards of teaching, and all examinations were conducted under oath-bound secrecy, and with the heaviest obligations on professors, to be assured of the knowledge of students before allowing them to pass. It might be easy to think, and many people are prone to do so, that in spite of the long years of study required, there was really very little to study in medicine at that time. Those who think so should read Professor Clifford Albert's address on the Historical Relations of Medicine and Surgery, delivered at the World's Fair at St. Louis in 1904. He has dwelt more on surgery than on medicine, but he makes it very clear that he considers that the thinking professors of medicine of the later Middle Ages were doing quite as serious work in their way as any that had been done since. They were carefully studying cases and writing case histories, they were teaching at the bedside, they were making valuable observations, and they were using the means at their command to the best advantage. Of course there are many absurdities in their therapeutics, but then we must not forget there have always been many absurdities in therapeutics, and that we are not free from them in our day. Professor Richard at the University of Paris said not long ago, Quote, the therapeutics of any generation is quite absurd to the second succeeding generation. End quote. We shall not blame the medieval generations for having accepted remedies that afterwards proved inert, for every generation has done that, even our own. <laughs>
Their study of medicine was not without lasting accomplishment, however. They laid down the indications and the dosage for opium. They used iron with success. They tried out many of the bitter tonics among the herbal medicines, and they used laxatives and purgatives to good advantage. Down at Montpellier, Gilbert, the Englishman, suggested red light for smallpox because it shortened the fever, lessened the lesions, and made the disfigurement much less. Finson was given the Nobel Prize partly for rediscovery of this. They segregated erysipelas and so prevented its spread. They recognized the contagiousness of leprosy, and though it was probably as widespread as tuberculosis is at the present time, they succeeded not only in controlling, but eventually obliterating it through Europe. It was in surgery, however, that the greatest triumphs of teaching of the medieval universities were secured. Most people are inclined to think that surgery developed only in our day. The great surgeons of the 13th and 14th centuries, however, anticipated most of our teaching. They investigated the causes of the failure of healing by first intention, recognized the danger of wounds of the neck, differentiated the venereal diseases, described rabies, and knew much of blood poisoning, and operated very skillfully. We have their textbooks of surgery, and they are a never-ending source of surprise. They operated on the brain, on the thorax, on the abdominal cavity, and did not hesitate to do most of the operations that modern surgeons do. They operated for hernia by the radical cure, though Mondeville suggested that more people were operated on for hernia for the benefit of the doctor's pocket than for the benefit of the patient. Guy de Choliac declared that in wounds of the intestines, patients would die unless the intestinal lacerations were sewed up, and he described the method of suture and invented a needle holder. We have many wonderful instruments from these early days, preserved in pictures at least, that show us how much modern advance is merely reinvention. They understood the principles of aseptic surgery very well. They declared that it was not necessary, quote, that pus should be generated in wounds, end quote. Professor Clifford Albert says, quote, They washed the wound with wine, scrupulously removing every foreign particle. Then they brought the edges together, not allowing wine or anything else to remain within. Dry adhesive surfaces were their desire. Nature, they said, produces the means of union in a viscous exudation, or natural balm, as it was afterwards called by Paracelsus, Paré, and Wurtz. In older wounds they did their best to obtain union by cleansing, desiccation, and refreshing of the edges. Upon the outer surface they laid only lint steeped in wine. Powders they regarded as too desiccating, for powder shuts in decomposing matters, Wine after washing, purifying, and drying the raw surfaces evaporates. End quote. Almost needless to say, these are exactly the principles of aseptic surgery. The wine was the best antiseptic that they could use, and we still use alcohol in certain cases. It would seem to many quite impossible that such operations as are described could have been done without anesthetics but they were not done without anesthetics. There were two or three different forms of anesthesia used during the 13th and 14th centuries. One method employed by Ugo de Lutza consisted of the use of an inhalant. We do not know what the material employed was. There are definite records, however, of its rather frequent employment. What a different picture of science at the medieval universities all this makes from what we have been accustomed to hear and read with regard to them. It is difficult to understand where the old false impressions came from. The picture of university work that recent historical research has given us shows us professors and students busy with science in every department, making magnificent advances, many of which were afterwards forgotten, or at least allowed to lapse into desuetude 
The positive assertions with regard to old-time ignorance were all made in the course of religious controversy. In English-speaking countries, particularly, it became a definite purpose to represent the old church as very much opposed to education of all kinds, and above all to scientific education. There is not a trace of that to be found anywhere, but there were many documents that were appealed to to conform the Protestant view. There was a papal bull, for instance, said to forbid dissection. When read, it proves to forbid the cutting up of bodies to carry them a distance for burial, an abuse which caused the spread of disease, and was properly prohibited. The church prohibition was international and therefore effective. At the time the bull was issued, there were twenty medical schools doing dissection in Italy, and they continued to practice it quite undisturbed during succeeding centuries. The papal physicians were among the greatest dissectors. Dissections were done at Rome, and the cardinals attended them. Bologna, at the height of its fame, was in the papal states. All this has been ignored, and the supposed bull against anatomy emphasized as representing the keynote of medical and surgical history. Then there was a papal decree forbidding the making of gold and silver. This was said to forbid chemistry or alchemy, and so prevent scientific progress. The history of the medical schools of the time shows that it did no such thing. The great alchemists of the time, doing really scientific work, were all clergymen, many of them very prominent ecclesiastics. Just in the same way, there were said to be decrees of the church, councils forbidding the practice of surgery. President White says in his Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom that, as a consequence of these, surgery was in dishonor until the Emperor Wenceslaus, at the beginning of the 15th century, ordered that it should be restored to estimation. As a matter of fact, during the two centuries immediately preceding the first years of the 15th century, surgery developed very wonderfully and we have probably the most successful period in all the history of surgery, except possibly our own. The decrees forbade monks to practice surgery because it led to certain abuses. Those who found these decrees and wanted to believe that they prevented all surgical development simply quoted them and assumed there was no surgery. The history of surgery at this time is one of the most wonderful chapters in human progress. The more we know of the Middle Ages, the more do we realize how much they accomplished in every department of intellectual effort. Their development of the arts and crafts has never been equaled in the modern time. They made very great literature, marvelous architecture, sculpture that rivals the Greeks, painting that is still the model for our artists, surprising illuminations. Everything that they touched became so beautiful as to be a model for all the aftertime. They accomplished as much in education as they did in all the other arts. Their universities had more students than any that have existed down to our own time, and they were enthusiastic students, and their professors were ardent teachers, writers, observers, investigators. While we have been accustomed to think of them as neglecting science, their minds were occupied entirely with science. They succeeded in anticipating much more of our modern thought, and even scientific progress, than we have had any idea until comparatively recent years. The work of the latter Middle Ages in mathematics is particularly strong, and was the incentive for many succeeding generations. Roger Bacon insisted that, without mathematics, there was no possibility of real advance in physical science. They had the right ideas in every way. While they were occupied more with the philosophical and ethical sciences than we are, these were never pursued to the neglect of the physical sciences in the strictest sense of that term. Is it not time that we should drop the foolish notions that are very commonly held because we know nothing about the Middle Ages, and therefore the more easily assume great knowledge, 
and get back to appreciate the really marvelous details of educational and scientific development, which are so interesting and of so much significance at this time? End of Part 2 of 2 End of Appendix 2《Appendix 3 of Old Time Makers of Medicine》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, September 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Old Time Makers of Medicine by James Joseph《Appendix 3 》Medieval Popularization of Science The idea of collecting general information from many sources, of bringing it together into an easily available form, so as to save others' labor, of writing it out in compendious fashion, so that it could readily pass from hand to hand, is likely to be considered typically modern. As a matter of fact, the Middle Ages furnish us with many examples of the popularization of science, of the writing of compendia of various kinds, of the gathering of information to save others the trouble, and above all, of the making of what, in the modern time, we would call encyclopedias. Handbooks of various kinds were issued, manuals for students and specialists, and many men of broad scholarship in their time devoted themselves to the task of making the acquisition of knowledge easy for others. This was true not only for history and philosophy and literature, but also for science. It is not hard to find in each century of the Middle Ages some distinguished writer who devoted himself to this purpose, and for the sake of the light that it throws on these scholars, and the desire for information that must have existed very commonly since they were tempted to do the work, it seems worth while to mention here their names and those of the books they wrote, with something of their significance, though the space will not permit us to give here much more than a brief catalogue raisonné of such works. Very probably the first who should be mentioned in the list is Bothius, who flourished in the early part of the sixth century. He owed much of his education to his adoptive father, afterwards his father-in-law, Symmachus, who, with Festus, represented scholarship at the court of the Gothic king, Theodoric of Verona. These three, Festus, Symmachus, and Bothius, brought such a reputation for knowledge to the court that they are responsible for many of the wonderful legends of Dietrich of Bern, as Theodoric came to be called in the poems of the medieval German poets. The three distinguished and devoted scholars did much to save Greek culture at a time when its extinction was threatened, and Bothius particularly left a series of writings that are truly encyclopedic in character. There are five books on music, two on arithmetic, one on geometry, translations of Aristotle's treatises on logic, with commentaries, of Porphyry's Isagogue, with commentaries, and a commentary on Cicero's Topica, Besides, he wrote several treatises in logic and rhetoric himself, one on the use of the syllogism and one on topics, and, in addition, a series of theological works. His great Consolations of Philosophy was probably the most read book in the early Middle Ages. It was translated into Anglo-Saxon by King Alfred, into Old German by Notker Teutonicus, the German monk of St. Gall, and its influence may be traced in Beowulf, in Chaucer, in High German poetry, in Anglo-Norman and Provencal popular poetry, and also in early Italian verse. Above all, the Divine Comedy has many references to it, while the Convito would seem to show that it was probably the book that most influenced Dante. Though it is impossible to confirm by documentary evidence the generally accepted idea that Bothius died a martyr for Christianity, the tradition can be traced so far back, and it has been so generally accepted, that this seems surely to have been the case. 
The fact is interesting, as showing the attitude of scholars toward the church and of the church toward scholarship thus early. The next great name in the tradition should probably be that of Cassiodorus, the Roman writer and statesman, prime minister of Theodoric, who, after a busy political life, retired to his estate at Vivarium, and, in imitation of St. Benedict, who had recently established a monastery at Monte Cassino, founded a monastery there. He is said to have lived to the age of ninety-three. His retirement favored this long life, for, after the death of Theodoric, troublous times came, and civil war, and only his monastic privileges saved him from the storm and stress of the times. He had been interested in literature and the collection of information of many kinds before his retirement, and it is not unlikely that his recognition of the fact that monastic life offered opportunities for the pursuit of this, under favorable circumstances, led him to take it up. While still a statesman, he wrote a series of works relating to history and politics and public affairs generally. These consisted mainly of chronicles and panegyrics, and twelve books of miscellanies called Verrier. After his retirement to the monastery, a period of ardent devotion to writing begins, and a great number of books were issued. He evidently gathered round him a number of men whom he inspired with his spirit, or, perhaps, selected, because he found that, while they had a taste for a quiet, peaceful, spiritual life, they were also devoted to the accumulation and diffusion of knowledge. A series of commentaries on portions of the scriptures was written, the Jewish antiquities of Josephus translated, and the ecclesiastical histories of Theodoric, Sozomen, and Socrates made available in Latin. Cassiodorus himself is said to have made a compendium of these, called the Historia Tripartita, which was much used as a manual of history during succeeding centuries. Then there were treatises on grammar, on orthography, and a series of works on mathematics. In all of his writings, Cassiodorus shows a special fondness for the symbolism of numbers. There is a well-grounded tradition that he insisted on the study of the Greek classics of medical literature, especially Hippocrates and Galen, and awakened the interest of the monks in the necessity for making copies of these fathers of medicine. The tradition that he established at Vivarium is also found to have existed at Monte Cassino, among the Benedictines, and, doubtless, to this is to be attributed the foundation of the medical school of Salerno, where Benedictine influence was so strong. It is probable, therefore, that to Cassiodorus must be attributed the preservation in as perfect a state as we have them of the old Greek medical writers. His main idea was, of course, the study of scriptures, but with just as many helps as possible. He thought that commentators and historians, not alone Christian, but also Hebrew and pagan, should be studied to illustrate it, and then the commentaries of the Latin fathers, so that a thoroughly rounded knowledge of it should be obtained. He thus began an Encyclopedia Biblica, and set a host of workers at its accomplishment. Every country in Europe shared this movement for the diffusion of information during the Middle Ages, and the works of men from each of these countries in succeeding centuries has come down to us, preserved in spite of all the vicissitudes to which they were so liable during the centuries before the invention of printing and the easy multiplication of books. To many people it will seem surprising to learn that the next evidence of deep broad interest in knowledge is to be found in the next century in the distant west of Europe, in the Spanish peninsula. It is a long step from the semi-barbaric splendor of the Gothic court at Verona to the bishop's palace in Seville in Andalusia. The two cities are separated by what is no inconsiderable distance in our day, in the seventh century, they must have seemed almost at the other end of the world from each other. Those who recall 
what we have insisted on in several portions of the body of this work with regard to the high place Spanish genius won for itself in the Roman Empire, and how much of culture among the Spaniards of that time the occurrence of so many important writers of that nationality must imply, will not be surprised at the distinguished work of a great Christian Spanish writer of the seventh century. Indeed, it would be only what might be expected for evidences of early awakening of the broadest culture to be found in Spain. The important name in the popularization of science in the seventh century is St. Isidore of Seville. He made a compendium of all the scattered scientific traditions and information of his time with regard to natural phenomena in a sort of encyclopedia of science. This consisted of twenty books, chapters, we would call them now, treating almost de omne re sibili et quibustum alis, everything knowable and a few other things besides. It is possible that the work may have been written by a number of collaborators under the patronage of the bishop, though there is no sure indication of this to be found either in the volume itself or even contemporary history. All the ordinary scientific subjects are treated. Astronomy, geography, mineralogy, botany, and even man and the animals have each a special chapter. Pochet, in his History of the Natural Sciences during the Middle Ages, calls attention to the fact that, in grouping the animals for collective treatment in the different chapters, sometimes the most heterogeneous creatures are brought under a common heading. Among the fishes, for instance, are classified all living things that are found in water, the whale and the dolphin, as well as sponges and oysters and crocodiles and sea serpents and lobsters and hippopotamuses all find a place together because of the common watery habitation. The early Spanish churchmen would seem to have had an enthusiastic zeal for complete classification that would surely have made him a strenuous modern zoologist. The next link in the tradition of encyclopedic work is the Venerable Bede, whose character was more fully honored by the decree on November 13th 1899, by Pope Leo XIII, declaring him a doctor of the church. Bede was the fruit of that ardent scholarship which had risen in England as a consequence of the introduction of Christianity. It had been fostered by the coming of scholar saints from Ireland, but was, unfortunately, disturbed by the incursions of the Danes. While Bede is known for his greatest work, the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which gives an account of Christianity in England from its beginning until his own day, he wrote many other works. His history is the foundation of all our knowledge of early British history, secular as well as religious, and has been praised by historical writers of all ages, who turn to it for help with confidence. He wrote a number of other historical works. Besides, he wrote books on grammar, orthography, the metrical art, on rhetoric, on the nature of things, the seasons, and on the calculation of the seasons. These latter books are distinctly scientific. His contributions to Gregorian music are now of great value. After this, al Suin and the monks, summoned by Charlemagne, take up the tradition of gathering and diffusing information, and the great monasteries of Tours, Fulda, and St. Gall carry it on. Besides these, in the ninth century, Monte Cassino comes into prominence as an institution where much was done of what we would now call encyclopedic work. After his retirement from Salerno, Constantine Africanus made his translations and commentaries on Arabian medicine, constituting what was really a medical encyclopedia of information not readily available at that time. After this, of course, the tradition is taken up by the universities, and it is only when, with the 13th century, there came the complete development of the university spirit, that encyclopedias reached their modern expression. Three great encyclopedists, Vincent of Beauvais, 
Thomas of Cantimprano and Bartholomaeus Anglicus are the most famous. Vincent consulted all the authors sacred and profane that he could lay hold on, and the number was, indeed, prodigious. I have given some account of him in The Thirteenth Greatest of Centuries, Catholic Summer School Press, New York, 3rd edition, 1910. It would be very easy to conclude that these encyclopedias, written by clergymen for the general information of the educated people of the times, contain very little that is scientifically valuable, and probably nothing of serious medical significance. Any such thought is, however, due entirely to unfamiliarity with the contents of these works. They undoubtedly contain absurdities. They are often full of misinformation. They repeat stories on dubious authority, and sometimes on hearsay, but usually the source of their information is stated, and especially where it is dubious, as if they did not care to state marvels without due support. Books of popular information, however, have always had many queer things, queer, that is, to subsequent generations, and it is rather amusing to pick up an encyclopedia of a century ago, much less a millennium ago, and see how many absurd things were accepted as true. The first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, issued 150 years ago, furnishes an easily available source of the absurdities of our more recent forefathers accepted. The men of the Middle Ages, however, were much better observers as a rule, and used much more critical judgment according to their lights than we have given them credit for. Often the information that they have to convey is not only valuable, but well digested, thoroughly practical, and sometimes a marvelous anticipation of some of our most modern thoughts. There is one of these encyclopedias which, because it was written in my favorite 13th century, I have read with some care. It is simply a development of the work of preceding clerical encyclopedists, and often refers to them. Because it contains some typical examples of the better sorts of information in these works, I have thought it worth while to quote two passages from it. The author is Bartholomaeus Anglicus, and the quaint English in which it is couched is quoted from Medical Lore, London, 1893. The book is all the more interesting because in a dear old English version, issued about 1540, the spellings of which are among the great curiosities of English orthography, it was often read and consulted by Shakespeare, who evidently quotes from it frequently, for not a little of the quaint scientific lore that he uses for his figures can be traced to expressions used in this book. The first of the paragraphs that deserves to be quoted discusses madness, or, as we would call it, lunacy, and sums up the causes, the symptoms, and the treatment quite as well as that has ever been done in the same amount of space. Quote, Madness cometh sometimes of passions of the soul, and of business and of great thoughts, of sorrow and of too great study, and of dread, sometime of the biting of a woodhound or some other venomous beast, sometime of melancholy meats, and sometimes of drink of strong wine. And as the causes be diverse, the tokens and signs be diverse. For some cry and leap and hurt and wound themselves and other men, and darken and hide themselves in privy and secret places. The medicine of them is that they be bound, that they hurt not themselves and other men. And namely, such shall be refreshed and comforted and withdrawn from cause and matter of dread and busy thoughts and they must be gladdened with instruments of music, and some deal be occupied. End quote. The second discusses in almost as thorough a way the result of the bite of a mad dog. The old English word for mad, wood, is constantly used. The causes, the symptoms, and the course of the disease, and its possible prevention by early treatment, are all discussed. The old tradition was already in existence that suffers from rabies or hydrophobia, 
as it is called, dreaded water, when it is really only because the spasm consequent upon the thought, even of swallowing, is painful, that they turn from it. That tradition has continued to be very commonly accepted even by physicians down to our own day, so that Bartholomew, the Englishman, in the thirteenth century, will not be blamed much for setting it forth for popular information in his time some seven centuries ago. The idea that free bleeding would bring about the removal of the virus is interesting, because we have in recent years insisted in the case of the very similar disease, tetanus, on allowing or deliberately causing wounds in which the tetanus microbe may have gained an entrance to bleed freely. Quote, the biting of a woodhound is deadly and venomous, and such venom is perilous, for it is long hidden and unknown, and increaseth and multiplieth itself, and is sometimes unknown to the year's end, and then the same day and hour of the biting, it cometh to the head, and breedeth frenzy. They that are bitten of a woodhound have in their sleep dreadful sights, and are fearful, a stonied, and wroth without cause, and they dread to be seen of other men, and bark as hounds, and they dread water most of all things, and are afeard thereof full sore and squeamous also. Against the biting of a woodhound, wise men, and ready use to make, the wounds bleed with fire or with iron, that the venom may come out with the blood that cometh out of the wound. End quote. Footnotes 1. Medicines aus der Altesten Kirchen Gestiste, Leipzig, 1892. 2. Faulis, London and Edinburgh, 1910. 3. My attention was called to the interesting story of the Jewish physicians of the Middle Ages and their scientific accomplishment while writing the article on Joseph Hertel for the Catholic Encyclopedia. His Das Arabische und Hebraische in der Anatomie, Wein, 1879, has some interestingly suggestive material on these important chapters of the history of medicine. I owe my opportunity to consult it to the courtesy of the Surgeon General's Library. Biographic material has been obtained from Carmoli's History of the Jewish Physicians, Translated by Dr. Dunbar for the Maryland Medical and Surgical Journal, some extra copies of which were printed by John Murphy and Company, Baltimore, about the middle of the 19th century. Boss and Hayser's Histories of Medicine and Pushman and Pagel's Handbook provided additional material, and I have found Landau's Gestica der Judischen Erze, Berlin, 1895, of great service. 4. Of course there are many absurd things recommended in the Talmud. We cannot remind ourselves too often, however, that there have been absurd things at all times in medicine, and especially in therapeutics. It is curious how often some of these absurdities have repeated themselves. We are liable to think it very queer that men should have presumed, or somehow jumped to the conclusion, that portions of animals might possess wonderful virtue for the healing of diseases of the corresponding special parts of man. We ourselves, however, within a little more than a decade, had a phase of opotherapy. How much less absurd it seems under that high-sounding Greek term, that was apparently very learned in its scientific aspects, yet quite as absurd as many phases of old-time therapy, as we look at it, we administered cardin for heart disease, and nephrin for kidney trouble, cerebrin for insanity, save the mark, and even prostate tissue for prostatism, and with reported good results. How many of us realize now that in this we were only repeating the absurdities, so often made fun of in old medicine, with regard to animal tissue and excrement therapeutics? The Talmud has many conclusions with regard to the symptoms of patients drawn from dreams, as, for instance, it is said to be a certain sign of sanguinous plethora, uh, 
when one dreams of the comb of a cock. One phase of our psychoanalysis in the modern time, however, has taken us back to an interpretation of dreams, different of course from this, yet analogous enough to be quite striking. 5. Maimonides by David Yellen and Israel Abrahams, Philadelphia, 1903. 6. Das Arabische und Hebraische in der Anatomie, Dr. Joseph Hertel, Wine, 1879. 7. Anatomy Antiquities, Rarores, Vienna, 1835. 8. It seems hard to understand how so useful an auxiliary to the surgeon as the ligature, it seems indispensable to us, could possibly be allowed to go out of use and even be forgotten. It will not be difficult, however, for anyone who recalls the conditions that obtained in old-time surgery. The ligature is a most satisfying immediate resource in stopping bleeding from an artery, but a septic ligature inevitably causes suppuration and almost inevitably leads to secondary hemorrhage. In the old days of septic surgery, Secondary hemorrhage was a surgeon's greatest and most dreaded bane. Some time from the fifth to the ninth day, a septic ligature came away under conditions such that inflammatory disturbance had prevented sealing of the vessel. If the vessel was large, then the hemorrhage was fast and furious, and the patient died in a few minutes. After a surgeon had a few deaths of this kind, he dreaded the ligature. He abandoned its use and took kindly to such methods as the actual cautery, red-hot knives for amputations, and the like, that would sear the surfaces of tissues and the blood vessels, and not give rise to secondary hemorrhage. A little later, however, someone not familiar with secondary risks would reinvent the ligature. If he were cleanly in his methods, and, above all, if he were doing his work in a new hospital, the ligature worked very well for a while. If not, it soon fell into innocuous desuetude again. 9. Pushman, Handbook der Gersaische der Medizin, Volume 1, page 652. 10. The first dentist who filled teeth with amalgam in New York some 80 years ago had to flee for his life because of a hue and cry set up that he was poisoning his patients with mercury. 11. Storia de la Sculota de Salerno. 12. It is probably interesting to note that the word universitas, as used here, has no reference to our word university, but refers to the whole world of students, as it were. In the Middle Ages, universities were called studia generalia, general studies, that is, places where everything could be studied and where everyone from any part of the world could study. Our use of the word university in the special modern sense of the term comes from the formal mode of address to the faculty of a university when popes or rulers sent them authoritative documents. Such documents began with the expression universitas vestra, all of you, in the old-time English, as preserved in the Irish expression, the whole of ye, referring to all the members of the faculty. The transfer to our term and signification university was not difficult. 13. Physicians wore a particular garb consisting of a cloak and often a mask, supposed to protect them from infections at the time, so that it was not difficult to make a characteristic picture as a sign for a pharmacy. These symbolic signs were much commoner and very necessary when people generally were not able to read. It is from that period that we have the mortar and pestle, as also the colored lights in the windows of the drug stores, and the many-colored barber pole. Also the big boot, key, watch, hat, bonnet, and the like, the last symbolic sign invention apparently being the wooden Indian for the tobacco store. 14. The Medical Library and Historical Journal, 1890-1900.
Brooklyn, December, 1906. 15. Taddeo, who was born in 1215, according to our usually accepted traditions in the matter, would have been seventy-five years of age when Mondino, as a youth of scarcely more than fifteen, went to the university. It might seem that so old a man would have very little influence over the young man. Taddeo, however, had, as we have said, a very strenuous old age. Everything in life had come to him late. He was well past thirty before he began to study philosophy and medicine, having been a seller of candles from necessity because of poverty in his younger years. His great success in practice came when he was past forty. He first began to teach when he was forty-five, and he was nearly fifty-five before he began to write. According to tradition, he married when he was nearly eighty, whether for the first or second time is not said, and while this might be considered, and would in some cases be, an indication of weakness of character, it would probably depend on whether he married or was married, it seemed in his case to have indicated a vigor of body and character, which shows very clearly how great was the possibility of his influence as a teacher having been maintained even up to this late time of life, and thus influencing a pupil who is to represent the most potent influence at the beginning of the next century. 16. Medical Library and Historical Journal, 1906. 17. Pilcher, Lock Sight, tells of her tomb. I venture to change his translation of the inscription in certain unimportant particulars. He says, Quote, we know the very place where she was buried in front of the Madonna delle Lettre in the church of San Pietro e Marcellino of the hospital of Santa Maria de Mareto, where her associate, Agino, mourning and inconsolable, placed a tablet with this inscription, Dis omnibus manibus, Orceo contenti, Alexandrae Galinae Puelae Persecitanae Penicilo Egregiae Ad Onitomen Exibendam Et Ignissimi Medici Mundini Lucii Paucis Comprandae Discipulae Cineres Carnes Hic Expectant Resurrectionem Vixit Annos Unde viginti, obiet studio, absunta, dae vicesimo sexto, marti anno salutis, mille trecentae et viginti sex, auto egenios lostrulanos, ob eam debtam, sui potiore, partes boliatus, sodale exemiae, Ac de se optime meritae inconsolabilis monumentum posuit. This inscription may be translated as follows. In this urn enclosed, the ashes of the body of Alexandra Giliani, a maiden of Periceto, skillful with her brush in anatomical demonstrations, and a disciple equaled by few, of the most noted physician, Mundinus of Luzzi, await the resurrection. She lived nineteen years. She died consumed by her labors. March 26, in the year of grace, 1326. Otto Agenus Lustralanus, by her taking away, deprived of his better part, his excellent companion, deserving of the best, has erected this tablet. End quote. 18. This is so striking that I quote their actual words from Gurlt, page 704. Quote, Multotes fit percussio in anteriori parte cranii et cranium en parte frangitur contraria. End quote. 19. Historical relations of medicine and surgery down to the 16th century. London, 1904. 20. Of course, for any extended knowledge of Mondeville, 
A modern reader must turn to Nicaise's translation of his Chirgeria, which, with an introduction and a biography, was published at Paris in 1893. Nicaise's publication of this and Guy de Choliac's treatise has worked a revolution in medical history and, above all, has made these old authors available for those who hesitate to take up a work written entirely in Latin. 21. In the very first book containing some account of human anatomy, a German volume by Conradus Mengenberger, called Puck de Nature, the date of printing which is about 1478, that is, less than ten years after the printing of the very first book, the Biblia Pauperum, which appeared in 1470, there are, according to Hayler, in his Bibliotheca Anatomica, a series of illustrations. This is the first illustrated medical work ever published. 22. Fordham University Press, New York, 1908. 23. Fordham University Press, New York, 1908. 24. See picture of the hospital ward at Tonnerre in the 13th greatest of centuries, 3rd edition, New York, 1911. 25. The Historical Relations of Medicine and Surgery by T. Clifford Albert, M.A., M.D., London, Macmillan and Company, Limited, 1905. 26. The beginning of the manuscript copy in the Bibliothèque Nationale is extremely interesting as an example of the English of the period, and alongside of it seems worthwhile to quote the closing sentence as Nicaise reproduces them. Quote, In God's name here beginneth the inventory of gathering together medicine in the part of surgery, compiled and fulfilled in the year of our Lord, 1363, by Guy de Coliaco, surgeon and doctor of physic, in the full seer study of Mount Pelier. On page 191, verso, here endeth the surgery of Mr. Guy de Choliaco, doctor of physic. End quote. The University of Cambridge copy has the title in the colophon. It runs as follows, quote, Ye inventor of Guido de Choliaco, doctor of physic and surgeon of ye university of Mount Pesolani of Montpelier's. End quote. The fly leaf contains the words quote, Jesu Christ save ye soul of Mitch. End quote. It is rather interesting to note how much closer to modern English is this copy made probably not much more than half a century later than the first one, and, above all, how much more nearly the spelling has come. At this time, however, and indeed, for more than a century later, spelling had no fixed rule, and a man might spell the same word quite differently, even on the same page. The difference between doctor spelled thus in the early edition, and doctors in the later one, probably means nothing more than personal peculiarities of the original translator or copyist. 27. In the case, this last word is written crapte. I have ventured to suggest craft, since a misreading between the two letters would be so easy. In the same way, I have suggested tentatively a changing of the Z in the title of the Bibliothèque Nationale copy to Y, making the word year instead of zir. 28. A history of dentistry from the most ancient times until the end of the 18th century by Dr. Vincenzo Guerini, editor of the Italian Review, Lodanto Stomatologia, Philadelphia and New York, Leon Febriger, 1909. 29. The first printed edition of Arculanus is that of Venice, 1542, bearing the Latin title, Joannis Arculane Commentaria in Nonum Librum Resis, etc. 30. 
It is curious to trace how old are the traditions on which some of these old stories that must now be rejected are founded. I have come upon the story with regard to Basil Valentine and the antimony and the monks in an old French medical encyclopedia of biography published in the 17th century, and at the time there was no doubt at all expressed to its truth. How much older than this it may be, I do not know though it is probable that it comes from the 16th century, when the Kakoith Scribendi attacked many people because of the facility of printing, and when most of the good stories that have so worried the modern dry-as-dust historian in his researches for their correction became a part of the body of supposed historical tradition. It is probably French in origin, because in that language, antimony is a tempting bait for that pseudophilology which has so often led to false derivations. 31. There is in the New York Academy of Medicine a thick 24-month volume in which three of the classics of older medicine are bound together. They are Kirkringius's Commentary on the Triumphal Chariot of Antimony, published at Amsterdam, 1671, Steno's Dissertation on the Anatomy of the Brain, published in Leyden in 1671, and Father Kircher's Scrutinium Physico Contagiose Louis Quae Dictor Pestis, Physico-Medical Discussions of the Contagious Disease, which is called Pest. This was published at Leipzig in 1659. Just how the three works came to be bound together is hard to say. Very probably, they belong to some old-time scholar, though there is nothing about the books to tell anything of the story. The fact that all three of the authors were ecclesiastics of the Catholic Church, Valentine a monk, Steno a bishop, and Kircher a Jesuit, would seem to be one common bond, and perhaps a reason for the binding of these rather disparate treatises together. In that case it is probable that the book came from an old monastic library, dispersed after the suppression of the order by some government. It seems not unlikely that the volume belonged at some time to an old Jesuit library, for they have suffered the most in that way. That these three classics of medicine should have been republished in handy volume editions within practically ten years shows an interest in medical literature that has not existed again until our own time, for during the eighteenth and early nineteenth centuries there was almost utter neglect of them. 32. Paper read before the first meeting of the American Guild of St. Luke. 33 published by Putnam's, New York, 1909. 34. Dublin, 1882. 35. The material for this chapter was gathered for a paper read before the Medical Improvement Society of Boston in the spring of 1911. In nearly its present form, it was published in the Popular Science Monthly for May 1911, and thanks are returned to the editor of that magazine for permission to reprint it here. The additions that have been made refer particularly to the estimation of Aristotle in the Middle Ages. 36. New York, Putnam, 1908. 37. De Solo et Mundo, 1, TR, 4, 10. End of footnotes. End of Old Time Makers of Medicine